Monteiros. É uma honra e um prazer tê-lo connosco nesta sessão de abertura eh, do ano académico do ICS. Caros estudantes, investigadores, técnicos e funcionários do ICS, Dear Catherine, in, on behalf of ICS, I'd like to welcome you to the formal opening of the academic year here at ICS and to thank you warmly for accepting our invitation to be here in Lisbon today. And also for helping us to think about a crucial issue for European societies today. Caros dirigentes, investigadores de outras escolas e unidades de investigação aqui presentes, meus senhores e minhas senhoras, obrigada a todos pela vossa presença num dia e num momento que é muito especial para o ICS. É o dia em que acolhemos e damos as boas-vindas aos novos estudantes, como também é o dia em que nos juntamos, toda a comunidade ICS, para ouvir a palestra Cedas Nunes, para pensar e debater um assunto relevante do ponto de vista da nossa agenda científica e do futuro das sociedades contemporâneas. Convidamos este ano a professora Catherine de Vries para nos falar sobre uma questão que nos preocupa a todos, o euroceticismo e o futuro da integração europeia. É um tema e uma conferência que nos vai obrigar a pensar na Europa e no futuro da União Europeia, mas não só, também no que está a acontecer aos valores civilizacionais a que as ciências sociais não são alheias, pois constituem o núcleo central das suas abordagens, a cultura humanista, o conhecimento, a liberdade, a igualdade. Na abertura do ano académico, queria sobretudo dirigir aos estudantes três notas breves. Em primeiro lugar, gostaria de lhes dar as boas-vindas e desejar-lhes muitas felicidades para o trabalho de investigação que vão realizar no âmbito do seu doutoramento. Fazer um doutoramento, como sabemos, é um desafio exigente, que implica adquirir e pôr em prática conhecimentos teóricos, tratar e interpretar dados, saber fazer trabalho de campo, que exige criatividade e persistência, treinar a escrita e a capacidade de comunicação, aprender a sintetizar e a divulgar resultados e, de uma forma geral, aprender os ossos do ofício. Ou, como disse o sociólogo Howard Becker, que tem vários livros em que se interroga sobre a prática social da investigação, aprender os truques do ofício. O livro dele chama-se Learning the Tricks of the Trade. Em segundo lugar, dizer-vos que fazer um doutoramento é também muito mais do que isso. É saber combinar autonomia individual e trabalho em equipa. O doutoramento é um empreendimento individual e solitário, mas também é o seu oposto. É um empreendimento coletivo, pois só num coletivo e com responsabilidade perante a sociedade é possível produzir e disseminar conhecimento. Também é aprender a praticar a dúvida sistemática que está na base do processo científico. A ciência procura a produção de conhecimento organizado e comprovado, mas sempre questionável, aberto à crítica, uma crítica salutar e estimulante, e ao progresso, assenta em saber cumulativo. É um conhecimento aberto aos valores da dúvida e da humildade, por tudo o que falha e por tudo que ainda se ignora, e pela busca incessante da verdade. Portanto, o espírito crítico, a cultura da transparência, bem como a cultura da responsabilidade, são ferramentas de base da ciência, bem como das ciências sociais. Fazer um doutoramento é também aprender a articular disciplinas e temáticas científicas diversas, tentando estabelecer articulações e diálogos constantes entre elas. É saber, é saber construir o encontro do nosso problema de estudo da disciplina de onde partimos, com outros conhecimentos e questionamentos colocados fora dela. As ideias e as respostas encontradas alimentam-se também desse encontro e desse diálogo. Por último, e relacionado com o ponto anterior, fazer um doutoramento é saber estabelecer a ligação com outros coletivos que vão receber e apropriar-se do conhecimento produzido no sentido de fazer a tradução desses saberes e de os relançar para a sociedade, para as políticas públicas, para a capacidade de produzir respostas sociais ou técnicas, estimulando o, o cruzamento com outros coletivos, 
os organismos públicos, autarquias, movimentos sociais, associações da sociedade civil, empresas, situadas não só no plano nacional, mas também no plano europeu e no plano global. Terceira e última nota para vos falar do ICS. O ICS, enquanto laboratório de investigação, é esse coletivo, o primeiro coletivo que vos vai procurar enquadrar, que vos vai orientar do ponto de vista da responsabilidade e da prática científica, do que é fazer investigação, do pensamento crítico, do que é estabelecer articulações entre disciplinas, temáticas, métodos, dos desafios da divulgação e do diálogo da ciência com a sociedade. Fazer distensão, como nós dizemos. É essa a nossa missão, é o nosso métier, e é por isso que vos recebemos de braços abertos. O enquadramento situa-se por isso não só ao nível do grupo de alunos e de professores do vosso programa de doutoramento, mas também e sobretudo ao nível da comunidade ICS, dos seus grupos de investigação, das comunidades de doutorandos e jovens investigadores, dos recursos e das infraestruturas, como os observatórios, os arquivos, a biblioteca, as edições dos seminários e das conferências, como, por exemplo, os seminários que tratam especificamente dos dilemas éticos da investigação. No início de 2019, éramos no ICS 314 pessoas, 119 estudantes inscritos em tese, 114 investigadores, 50 assistentes de investigação, 31 técnicos e administrativos. Somos uma instituição internacionalizada e aberta à Europa e ao mundo. 36% dos nossos investigadores e 38% dos nossos alunos são de nacionalidade estrangeira. Assim, o nosso modelo de formação e de ensino também é um modelo, um modelo aberto, em rede e internacionalizado. Aliás, 75% dos nossos investigadores dão aulas, dão aulas na Universidade de Lisboa e noutras escolas e universidades nacionais, mas também noutros países da Europa e fora da Europa. E essa projeção para fora do ICS é importante para reforçar e alimentar as redes de colaboração científica nos planos nacional e internacional. Os grupos de investigação do ICS são também fundamentais do ponto de vista da vossa aprendizagem e integração. Promovem seminários, debates e atividades de extensão. São sete grupos de investigação que cruzam Diferentes disciplinas das ciências sociais, a história, a ciência política, a sociologia, a antropologia, a economia, a geografia, a psicologia social. As dinâmicas disciplinares e interdisciplinares do GIs podem ajudar-vos a estabelecer ligações fecundas entre temáticas e disciplinas. Para terminar, duas mensagens. Uma mensagem de agradecimento a todos os investigadores e técnicos do ICS que recebem, acolhem e formam os nossos estudantes. Um agradecimento especial aos serviços de estudos pós-graduados, à Maria Goretti, onde está Maria Goretti? À Sónia Arroz, à Cláudia Andrade, à Raquel Brito, pelo trabalho competente e incansável. Um agradecimento especial também a todos os investigadores formadores, os que coordenam e organizam as ofertas formativas dentro e fora do ICS e todos os que orientam teses de mestrado e de doutoramento. Para os estudantes, uma mensagem. Pratiquem o pensamento crítico e criativo. Cultivem a responsabilidade, a transparência e a partilha de saberes e perspectivas. Procurem orientadores e equipas que devolvam a confiança e a iniciativa. Espero que encontrem no ICS um ambiente de trabalho acolhedor e motivador, Esperamos todos juntos, investigadores que ensinam e orientam, técnicos que dão apoio, contribuir para que o vosso percurso de doutoramento seja um sucesso. Muito obrigada. First of all, uh, thank, uh, thanks, Karin, and uh, João and Marina for the invitation, and uh, it's a great honor to be here 
uh, with Catherine in this, uh, in this event. So thanks for giving me the possibility to express publicly my gratitude to the ICS for this first year of PhD. Uh, in few words, I'll try to present here my opinion on what represents the beginning of a new academic cycle at ICS. <coughs> I believe uh, life is made of symbols, necessary symbols that can help us to succeed. And time is definitely one of the most important of them. Moments like the beginning of a new academic year then represent a window of opportunity to evaluate what we've done so far and what we are about to do next. To be a PhD student is to deal with time in all its splendor. During this journey, we'll need time to think about what we want to write, to understand what we want to do, and to find what really motivates us as new researchers. Other times, we will have to meet deadlines working hard to present and deliver things in the nick of time. But there will be also time to talk with people, to discuss and learn a lot. After one year of PhD, my humble advice to my colleagues that are about to start, enjoy your time at ICS. I say this for one main reason. This is an institution of excellence. Excellence in infrastructural, administrative, and intellectual terms. Infrastructural because it offers us the possibility to study in a pleasant, well-located, organized environment with easy access to school support material and research tools. We have an incredible social science-oriented library where we find the publications we need and also the necessary support to assess the publications that are difficult to find. Administrative, because we, the students, feel that we can count on the staff when we need help to overcome the obstacles that may appear and to believe in our potential as future researchers. Intellectual, because of the unconditional support we receive from all professors, a team of scholars with vast academic experience that is available to offer us a direct, easy, and above all, all welcoming orientation. May the academic year begin. I wish one more year of challenges, learning, and achievements for all the ICS community. Thank you. Yes. Senhor Vice-Reitor, Professor João Barreiro, uh, Senhora Diretora do ICS, Doutora Karine Wall, uh, Senhor Presidente do Conselho de Escola, Professor António Costa Pinto, Senhor Presidente do Conselho Científico, Ana Nunes de Almeida, uh, caro Gustavo Maciel, caros colegas, caros estudantes, uh, é um prazer para mim estar aqui a dar-vos as boas-vindas uh, aos novos doutorandos, sobretudo aos novos doutorandos do ICS. Um, este ano acolhemos 62 novos estudantes de doutoramento. É o nosso desejo que se sintam aqui em casa e que encontrem aqui as melhores condições para a vossa formação e para a re realização das vossas teses. O ICS, já foi dito, é uma escola da Universidade de Lisboa que se dedica em exclusivo à investigação e à formação avançada em ciências sociais e onde a investigação e a formação avançada se fazem em articulação estreita. O ICS participa na oferta de 10 programas doutorais, em parceria com outras escolas da Universidade de Lisboa, em associação interuniversitária ou em exclusivo. Temos doutoramentos disciplinares em Antropologia, em História, em Política Comparada, em Psicologia Social e em Sociologia, e temos também, participamos também na oferta de doutoramentos em áreas de estudo interdisciplinares focadas em alguns dos tópicos críticos do mundo contemporâneo. É o caso de alterações climáticas e políticas de desenvolvimento sustentável, 
de Ciências da Sustentabilidade, dos Estudos do Desenvolvimento, de Filosofia da Ciência, Tecnologia, Arte e Sociedade e de Migrações. Colaboramos também na, no Doutoramento em Enfermagem da Universidade de Lisboa e da Escola Superior de Enfermagem de Lisboa. Participamos ainda na oferta de dois mestrados, o mestrado em Estudos Brasileiros e o mestrado em Cultura Científica e Divulgação das Ciências. Promovemos, o ICS promove, todos os anos, várias escolas de verão e de inverno, que são cursos pós-graduados de curta duração, abertos não só aos investigadores e, e, e muito em especial aos estudantes do doutoramento da casa, mas a toda a, a, a comunidade exterior. Uh, por fim, colaboramos também ativamente na formação universitária para séniores da Universidade de Lisboa. Bom, o ICS é uma casa que acolhe neste momento 180 estudantes de doutoramento. Como foi dito pela doutora Karen, uh, cerca de 40% dos nossos doutorandos são de nacionalidades outras que a portuguesa. Estão aqui a iniciar uma aventura que durará três ou quatro anos, consoante os cronogramas dos vossos doutoramentos. E, por isso, tal como o Gustavo, embora não tenha combinado nada com ele, vou dizer alguma coisa acerca do tempo. Fazer uma tese de doutoramento é uma corrida de fundo, é uma maratona. É uma prova de resistência, por isso. Como acontece com qualquer prova, é sempre connosco que estamos a competir, não é com os outros. Os vossos colegas são os vossos companheiros de jornada. Para o sucesso de cada um, é muito importante que se conheçam, que troquem ideias e experiências, que se apoiem mutuamente. Quero aproveitar esta ocasião para vos dar meia dúzia de conselhos, que valem o que valem, e sabendo que é muito mais fácil dar conselhos do que segui-los. Primeiro, que a vossa meta no doutoramento deve ser uma interrogação sobre o mundo que vos motive pessoalmente. A maioria de vós já trará consigo a sua interrogação, a sua curiosidade, a sua vontade de saber mais acerca de o que quer que seja. Encontrarão aqui nesta casa toda a liberdade e todo o estímulo intelectual para desenvolverem essa vossa vontade de saber. A interrogação que cada um traz consigo tem depois de ser transformada num objeto de estudo inteligível e original no quadro de uma disciplina uh, científica ou de uma área de investigação em que cada um de vocês se enquadrará. E depois, o desenho teórico e metodológico da pesquisa tem de levar também em conta o tempo de que dispõe para a realizar. Para se chegar à meta, nesta maratona, é preciso estabelecê-la com realismo à partida. E depois é preciso aprender a manter o ritmo, definindo etapas e objetivos intercalares, um artigo proposto para publicação, um paper apresentado numa conferência, um capítulo entregue. Só assim, doseando o esforço em conjunto com os vossos orientadores, se consegue chegar em forma ao fim. Definam por isso com os vossos orientadores esses vossos prémios de percurso. Tenham tempo também para vocês e para aqueles de quem gostam. O descanso e a companhia são tão importantes como o trabalho. Não deixem que o doutoramento colonize toda a vossa vida. Sempre que precisarem, peçam ajuda. Para os estudantes trabalhadores, e temos vários este ano, como costumamos ter, os desafios são mais e são, claro, mais exigentes. Vários estudantes nesta situação vão candidatar-se a bolsas de doutoramento neste ano letivo. No trabalho com os orientadores e no trabalho nos seminários de projeto, encontrarão apoio para prepararem candidaturas a bolsas bem-sucedidas. Os vossos tutores no primeiro ano e os vossos orientadores no segundo, nos anos seguintes são os vossos treinadores com base na sua própria experiência de investigação e de orientação, tem a responsabilidade de vos ajudar a definir metas relevantes, inovadoras e alcançáveis, de vos acompanhar ao longo da corrida, verificando o rumo, corrigindo quando for preciso, e de vos dar motivação e foco. Desejo por isso aos colegas que orientam os 69 doutorandos, novos doutorandos, um ano de trabalho 
muito gratificante e cheio de aprendizagens. Um, já foi dito que todos os estudantes são convidados a participar na dinâmica dos sete grupos de investigação em que nos organizamos. Um, tirem também proveito dos seminários e das conferências que pautam o dia-a-dia -dia do Instituto, mesmo daqueles que não têm relação direta com as vossas áreas de estudo e com os vossos tópicos de investigação. Porque muitas vezes é aí, em contato com, com outras disciplinas e outras linguagens, que surgem as melhores ideias. O Gabinete de Estudos Pós-Graduados do ICS está ao vosso dispor para vos ajudar em tudo o que sejam assuntos administrativos. Contem por isso com o acompanhamento da Maria Goretti, da Sónia Arroz, da Cláudia Andrade e um, da Raquel Brito, no caso dos doutorandos em alterações climáticas. O Gabinete de Estudos Pós-Graduados preparou, com o apoio do Conselho Pedagógico, o Guia do Estudante deste ano, que encontram numa banca à saída desta sala e que encontram também uh, online no site do ICS. Pronto, esperamos que este guia vos ajude à vossa integração no Instituto e na Universidade de Lisboa. Os estudantes do Instituto de Ciências Sociais participam em dois dos quatro órgãos de governo do ICS, o Conselho de Escola e o Conselho Pedagógico. Aos representantes dos estudantes no Conselho nestes dois órgãos, a Rita Cantu e a Sofia Serra da Silva, no Conselho de Escola, e ao João Bahia, à Joana Rebelo de Moraes e ao Rodrigo Domenech, no Pedagógico, a todos desejo um bom trabalho neste segundo ano do vosso mandato. Aos restantes estudantes, apelo a que partilhem as dúvidas, as críticas e as sugestões que tiverem acerca da vossa vida no Instituto, com estes vossos representantes, no Conselho de Escola e no Pedagógico, que estão nestes órgãos, precisamente, para vos ouvir e para vos representar. Enfim, dito isto, desejo a todos um ano excelente. Muito obrigado. Boa tarde a todos. Senhor Professor uh, João Barreiros, Vice-Reitor da Universidade de Lisboa, Doutora Karin Noal, Diretora do ICS, Doutora Ana Nunes da Almeida, uh, Presidente uh, do Conselho Científico, Minhas Senhoras e Meus Senhores, é um prazer estar aqui convosco. I will switch to English now. Uh, uh, first thing I'd like to say is that when we decided on the topic of this uh, on the topic and, uh, and inviting uh, Catherine de Vries to be here with us, we were almost certain that uh, Brexit would be a done deal by then. <laughs> and so we would be sitting here today very happy discussing the after effects of that and how your skepticism and the future of political integration would look like uh, now that the UK would be out. But of course this didn't happen. So uh, that's, uh, that's politics for you. Um, we are... Um, at a special moment of uh, the process of European integration. 2019 has been a momentous year for different reasons. We had the European Parliament election that for the first time had a turnout of over 50%. Uh, of course, that was not the case in Portugal, but that's another story. And we had a green wave uh, for the first time, a very strong showing of green parties but also the, the largest contingent of populist parties and, and populist MEPs uh, that we have seen uh, in Europe. So Europe is an increasingly politicizing issue, and um, this is uh, why we have uh, invited Professor Catherine de Vries to be here today, because she is one of the most uh, uh, sterling uh, academics that deals with, these, with this issue uh, uh, today. So, uh, pro uh, Professor Catherine de Vries is Professor of Political Behavior in Europe in the Department of Political Science and Politi Public Administration at the Free University of Amsterdam. Previously, she has held professorships at the University of Oxford, Ex Essex and Geneva, as well as visiting posts at the University of Mannheim, Vienna and the e European University Institute in Flo uh, Florence. In 2014, Catherine received the American Political Science Association Emerging Scholar Award for her contribution to the field of elections, public opinion, and voting behavior. 
she has published extremely uh, of uh, European integration and I'd like to say two things about it which uh, may be interesting for the new students which are start who are starting their doctorates uh, at ICS. The first thing to note is that we can no longer think about our national societies uh, in an insular way. So the, European, the process of European integration means that supranational level governance has to be at the center of uh, any social science research. The fact that uh, politics is no, no longer national, but societies are uh, constantly in, in, in relation to others who are uh, outside the national realm. And so this is the first uh, uh, main point that uh, is important to think about uh, social science research today. And the second um, major uh, change that uh, is also at the center of Professor uh, De Vries' research is the importance that citizens have acquired for the process of European integration. Until uh, the 90s, we could say that the process of European integration was very elitist. But this all changed with the Maastricht Treaty. and. In order to understand the process of European integration today, you need to understand citizen attitudes and how they are driving politics. And that is why, again, Professor de Vries' work is so important because she is very much a leading scholar within that analysis of public opinion and the process of European integration. Final word to say that uh, Professor de Vries is also, uh, has been contributing to in increased diversity uh, within social sciences, and this means uh, promoting m more women to uh, uh, appear, but also other, uh, other groups, and I salute her for it. And um, I will then pass the uh, word to uh, Professor De Vries. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Marina. Uh, obrigada. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for the, uh, for the invitation. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and I also, uh, because it's such a nice uh, occasion that it's the start of, uh, of the academic year, although I've, I've understood the academic year has already started, but nonetheless, a celebration of new people embarking on their PhD thesis. So when I started working on the degree to which European integration affects national politics. My first paper got blatantly rejected at a journal because I was studying something that was irrelevant. That was the actual quote. I still have it above my, my, uh, 
my computer. Just remind me of the fact that sometimes things happen and you, s you not to say that I saw it, but some things that had ha started to happen in the constitutional treaty referendum in the Netherlands, right, where it was voted down in a very pro-EU or that may very perceived as pro-EU member state that embarked me in then 2007 to defend my PhD on that topic. And I think it maybe had not, you know, settled in in some other member states or among other people. And I'm not saying that you should always not listen to critique, but I think one part of becoming a good academic is to realize which critique is really useful and is really constructive and what is not so much useful and says more about someone else than about you. <laughs> I have not necessarily uh, you know, figured that out, but it is something to really focus on when you think about embarking on your academic career. So I'm really happy to be here, not only uh, because uh, I respect both uh, uh, Marina and also Pedro, who I both know very much, the political scientists here very much, and their research. And I also met uh, Marina's uh, Maple group, so her ERC group today, who's been amazing, also her students. But it's also important, I think, that, um, that we think about Europe, and we think about Europe within all member states, right? Portugal is not featuring in every newspaper article. Britain is at this moment in time. But we should also really uh, not get too carried away but what we see in the, in, in the news and figure out on what the kind of core issues are. And I try to hope to do that today. So the talk of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of today is uh, entitled in the same way as the book, so Euroscepticism and the Future of European Integration. I'm not going to give you everything. Uh, I hope you also find some time to buy the book. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a, of, of a sense of, uh, of what it's about. So of course, uh, as Marina was saying, uh, this is uh, Boris Johnson uh, looking like the singer of The Clash, and it doesn't say a London calling, but Brexit calling, and the Queen is playing the drums. Um, the idea of, of, of kind of Brexit and what Brexit has done is really featuring in a lot of the discussions about Europe today. It is uh, what uh, this week um, outgoing, or probably outgoing uh, Commission President Juncker uh, called a lose-lose situation for the European Union, even though Brexit looks horrible uh, at this moment in time because of internal divisions, and I'm going to talk about that uh, today, we shouldn't forget uh, that if the club was so great, no membership would want to leave it. So in that way, we really need to think about what the future of the EU would be, that it's an EU that works for every member state, not just a couple of member states, and how we could do that. And that's also something as an academic that I take very seriously. But today I'll try to see a little bit of the contours of public opinion, and try to uh, make a little bit sense, is this, you know, is this just the odd one out, you know, Britain being already always flirting with Euroscepticism a lot, or do we see anything in other member states? What has the effect of Brexit been also on public opinion in the EU27, on the remaining member states? Regardless of, of you know, if Boris Johnson is going to get his election, uh, get his election, if we're going to see uh, a, uh, an extension, I've heard you maybe, I, I was a bit busy today, but... Uh, that Barnier is going to wait a little bit uh, on the decision of, of, of giving a delay or not, or granting an extension. Uh, but I want to take it a little bit out of this, uh, of this discussion. So this is what the book is about. Brexit plays a feature role, so this is, but I think the image is really crucial. In the way what we talk about, about, talk about the EU, and I just talked a little bit before with Marina about how, and Pedro, how, how in the, the, the recent Portuguese election campaign, Europe didn't really feature, right? So it's sometimes it's still people have an opinion about it, but the way they think about it is very much framed from their national perspective. And I think this is what's something that a lot of EU scholars have kind of uh, not got. So they, your skepticism is not just about the EU. And that's what I'm going to uh, try to, talk, to convince you of today. And it comes from my own position that I work both in EU, EU studies and European integration studies, as well as just work uh, like many here, on comparative politics and p political behavior and elections. And that also makes you understand that maybe some of the discussions in Brussels do not feature in the same way in domestic member states. And also what happened in the Eurozone crisis in Portugal was very different than what happened in my native country, the Netherlands. So these differences really reflect uh, uh, in public opinion. And we could even go regionally, but I'm going to focus much more on, on national differences. So I'm going to focus on, uh, on three questions. The political scientists will, will kind of maybe recognize the first question. Uh, one very famous uh, 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 American political scientist asked before Trump already, what's the, wrong, what's, what's the matter with Kansas? And Larry Bartels, uh, a political behavior scholar in the US, and carving out already some of the differences of what we saw later on. Maybe he wouldn't have expected that, but in the kind of Trump vote. That maybe some of the ways we were thinking about public opinion was not in the way that people actually thought. 
So really exploring the puzzling pattern of Euroscepticism, and I'm going to try to do that. But then I'm going to go so also kind of walk you through a little bit, knowing that most of you do not know that literature as well as I do, so I'll try to give you a little bit of sense of what have been existing answers to how we should think about public opinion, and I'll try to convince you that they're very important answers, but they don't give the entire picture and what we need to fully understand. Then I'm going to go into, and that's maybe some of you who know me a little bit better, I also really like measurement and really like to understand of how we measure things. And I think that for a long time we've understood Euroscepticism in the wrong way. We thought it was only about Europe. And I think if we start thinking that this is a conversation between what you find at home versus what you find in Europe, and if you think you're worse or better off, is crucial. So that's what I'm going to introduce this kind of what I call a benchmarking theory of public opinion. And then I'm going to explain why I go through this entire intellectual exercise and why does it matter? What are we able to get, what we otherwise could not get, and why does this help us? In the end, if I have time, I'm going to discuss a little bit what I think are crucial challenges for the future of, uh, of, uh, of, of Europe and in the way that it is. And that's going to be, you know, as an academic, I'm not going to talk about the feasibility of everything that's uh, the, the realm of politicians, but I'm going to talk very much about, about what I think is uh, are crucial steps. So Marina mentioned it already, for a long time we thought that you know, public opinion was kind of irrelevant uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in public opinion. Most people actually also when you ask them, they're A, not interested in politics, contrary to what many political scientists think. They spend their time uh, featuring out what, uh, what football clubs have done over the weekend, you know, not necessarily what is happening in Brexit. Uh, and secondly also that Europe is not the most important issue. However, the Eurozone crisis and the refugee crisis really changed that a little bit. And I think Europe, quote unquote, hit home. First element was already in the Maastricht Treaty in some member states, think uh, uh, Denmark, think also later on Ireland, where certain treaties were, were voted down. Also constitutional treaty, which is now the Lisbon Treaty, of course, uh, voted down in France and, and the Netherlands, but overall it was not the main issue. But there were periods in the crisis where Europe became the main issue. Brexit is now the main issue, of course, in Britain. So this is also reflected in when we just look at, so one of the founding fathers of European studies, he was the advisor of my advisor, uh, Bernie Haas, who was, uh, who was at Berkeley. And he wrote a book in, uh, in so my book was published in 2018. Uh, this was you know, the kind of uh, 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 more than half a century later. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, this kind of you know, integration scholar, European integration scholar wrote the following. It is as impractical as it is unnecessary to have recourse to general public opinion surveys. It suffices to single out and define the political elites in the participating countries to study the reactions to integration and assess changes in their attitude on their part. And it, were, and it really hits home what Marina said before, that Europe was an elitist project. It was also studied very much from international relations and it was, stu uh, and it was studied by people who focused on European law because one of the big drivers of European integration has been the European Court of Justice by its rulings on the single market, right? And so for many political scientists it was not very crucial and public opinion was not really uh, uh, important. Fast forward to, this is from the 2014 European parliamentary election because my book was, not, was written before the 2019, but we kind of see the same pattern in the 2019 European parliamentary election. Not only did Eurosceptic parties do very well in the 2019 election, they already did that in 2014, so this just plots, there's nothing on the y-axis, just so you know. It's only on the x-axis. The y-axis is only so that you see the, the country names in a proper way. So this gives you the, the, the vote share, and it's not very different actually in 2019, the vote share of hard Eurosceptic parties in the European parliamentary election. So why do I use the European parliamentary election? Because they're fought under the same electoral rules, right? It's much more difficult to win as the Brexit party in Britain when you're, when you're ruling under... under um, uh, first past the post, so it's a majoritarian system, more, much more hard to break through. European parliamentary election is our proportional representation in every country. Some countries it means you have the same system, the Netherlands has exactly the same system, some countries change. So here we see the vote share of those parties that in their manifestos talk about exit or talk about major renationalization of the EU, right? So what you see is interestingly, that on the top of the, of the kind of the, the high scores on hard Eurosceptic parties are not the countries we would expect given the Eurozone crisis. It's not the Ireland, it's not Greece, it's not Portugal. Italy is up there, but interestingly, it was uh, the North at that moment in time where the League 
got the majority of the votes, right? Most Eurosceptic party in Italy. But it's here, France, Denmark, Sweden, Great Britain, the Netherlands and Austria, countries that actually did not feel the Eurozone crisis that strongly, neither do they ha had they taken in a lot of refugees, right? Germany may be the exception, but even Germany has changed on that. So why is this important? Because it is a little bit of a puzzle of why do we see a rise in Euroscepticism in countries that actually did not do that badly in the Eurozone crisis, right? This country, which of course had huge ramifications of the Eurozone crisis, has a very pro-EU population. It's also pro-EU party. There's some, on the, especially on the left, there's some critical voices, but overall, it's much for you. Look at the neighboring country, Spain, exactly the same story. Whereas where you see a lot of rise in Eurosceptic parties is in actually richer Northern European member states. And that will I show does not fit what we existingly thought what drives public opinion. So the existing explanations have been twofold. I mean, I think every social science explanation is twofold. <laughs> something has to do with interest, something has to do with culture, identity, right? So it's, it's what you talk about when you talk about populism, it's what you talk about when you talk about altruism, you know, where do things come from, either from your interests or from your identity. There's been a lot of discussion on the race between these two explanations. I've never fully understood it. I think people both have identities and both have interests, so probably both of those things matter, but nonetheless, that's been the, the kind of dominant explanation. So the first is the interest explanation, and that's both on your pocketbook as well as the country. So if you do well, or if your country does well, you're more likely to be pro-EU. That's the idea. You just saw that that's not actually the reality, right, on the, on the country. The second explanation is when you are nationalist, you're going to be more anti-EU. So if you're more exclusively national, right? I'm not arguing that, that if you just estimate this in a survey that you're going to find nationalists more, being more anti-EU, yeah, I, you know, it's almost measuring the same thing, but anyway, uh, if you see this as a thing, or that people who are maybe poor can be more anti-EU, but it doesn't show you where the real increase of your skepticism came from in, in the kind of period between, well, Manila said in post 1990, I would even go stronger early 2000s to now, right? Where we really see an increase in your skepticism in many countries. And neither of these fit that well on trying to explain that change. So just to give you, an, in the book I also do that at the individual level, here I just give you an aggregate because it's easier to, uh, to represent. So here we have the, the same hard Eurosceptic vote share in 2014 and the unemployment rate. I can do exactly the same for now, but of course this is where you really still felt the crisis very strong, right? So countries in the south were not recovering yet, so it's still 2014. So here you see that there's not a real relationship between the unemployment rate, which is the best way to measure the crisis effect, because, of course, a lot of other indicators economically are fixed within the EU, right, by the ECB, right? Inflation rates are not going to be so different, right? So if you look at high unemployment rate, Greece are not the countries that you see. You, know, you see some, uh, think of Golden Dawn, think of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, the independent Greeks, but you, you don't see the kind of huge, you actually see low unemployment countries that have either no Eurosceptic parties, Luxembourg, for example, Malta, or uh, low unemployment countries that have very high Eurosceptic party support, right? So it doesn't fit so nicely with this idea that if your country does well, you're gonna be more pro-EU. Actually, we see countries that are doing very well that have very uh, a large support for Eurosceptic parties. But even within countries, you could say, well, you know, these are averages. They don't really capture it. Even if you look at the Brexit vote, just to say, and then I've done a lot of work on that, the Eurosceptic vote was not won in left behind constituencies. <coughs> Yes, there were lots of people in left behind constituencies that voted pro-Brexit, but the actual Brexit was won in the south of England. And that's partly why you see also now the issues. And it was, con it was actually constituencies that did fairly well. There you had the margins that were, that were s small. Those were triggered towards leave, also probably by political entrepreneurs. So here's just to give you two. Uh, Sunderland and Bournemouth. Bournemouth is the Silicon Beach in the UK, also has some pensioners, I mean Silicon Beach, not, not where close to, to, uh, to California, but, but a lot of tech companies, right? Outside of London. And then uh, Sunderland, very deprived area, right? So you know maybe about the Nissan factories that are, about, I heard this morning, I saw this morning, they're probably going to close. Um, they voted with a large margin uh, uh, leave. But equally, they voted leave in Bournemouth. So just to give you two indicators that, pl that political scientists use for deprivation, unemployment rates 
and house and house prices because house prices is a is, a, is a maybe a better indicator of how wealthy a person is rather than income right the the, the return on equity is higher than the return on Piketty right than the return on, on on labor so you see actually in two diverting areas in which unemployment rate is a concept extremely low in Bournemouth and house prices are way beyond the average there was still the vote margin was smaller but there was still lead so it doesn't also fit this idea that if you do well you're just going to be very pro EU right. So then what we also don't see is this kind of identity. Is it all about identity? Those people who are very, nation very nationalists, right, or very exclusive. So again, we know one of the countries, of course, here you see on the, on the, on the, on the x-axis, the share of people who feel exclusively national. So this is the way that this literature operationalizes. I don't think it's the best operationalization, but this is the way they measure it. You have a question, what do you feel? British only, British and European, European and British, or European only, right? So the highest share of exclusive nationalists are found in Greece, Cyprus, and, and the UK. And we know that it's been consistent across time. Uh, and then some countries, I don't know where Portugal is here, if you maybe see it. Um, and what you also see is not this clear pattern that does those countries that feel very, very nationalist, you're gonna see most Eurosceptic party support. You could say, well, this is, not a, this, is, this is a more dynamic issue. This comes from political entrepreneurs who are mobilizing you know, exclusively national ideas against the EU. So this is just taken from the Netherlands. Here we have the same, the same indicator, so feel national only. Note that that's the top line, it's going down, right? So we know that younger generations are more likely to feel inclusive. They're, they're primarily Dutch and European. And then we see these extreme right vote shares. So that's Wilders, I don't know if you know him, right? The guy with the weird hair. Uh, uh, very, uh, very extreme right. Earlier on, Leispim Fortuyn in the Netherlands, one of the most kind of successful political entrepreneurs. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the right, they, they mobilized an extremely exclusive national identity uh, uh, and, and mobilized that in their campaigns. But actually, we don't see that there's more people who started identifying that way. So if it's driven by that, it's, 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 it seems it cannot be that that's the driver, right? It needs to be something else. So not to say that these experiences are not important, but they might not really help us understand why we saw this increase in Euroscepticism in countries that did actually fairly well, where in this country we still, even though the austerity measures out of, out of Brussels, even though there, you know, people might not feel 100% okay with what came out in, in the Eurozone crisis, people are still quite supportive. And I'll try to, exp to convince you of why that's the case. So the, so the argument that I try to cover out, that, that, that the way people have been measuring Euroscepticism, the way we've understood Euroscepticism in previous research, that we haven't spent enough time. We've spent so much time trying to figure out if it's identity or if it's interest, which I think is not the most interesting discussion anyway, but we have spent little time on trying to define what Euroscepticism really is. So how, how, well, what goes on in people's heads when they think about that? So this is very stylized, what I'm going to give you, but it's just a way to think about it. So what I suggest is that your skepticism is relational. It takes place in the conversation with a benchmark. So it's the idea, let's say we could put the benefits of a system, being it your national system, so uh, the system in Portugal, or the EU, on one dimension, from negative to positive benefits. So are you evaluating it positively or negatively? The way I conceive of someone being a Eurosceptic, when they think that the alternative to membership is always worse, the, uh, so the, sorry, the way that I, that I define your, uh, European support is that the alternative to membership is always worse than membership, right? So what people do in their heads, and that was also the core of the Brexit debate, right, was what's going to happen when we leave? House prices are going to collapse. That was the Cameron uh, uh, campaign. The other side is we're going to get 350 million for the NHS. We're going to be better off. It doesn't matter if this is true or not. This is in people's heads. It's subjective, right? We're talking about public opinion, what people think. So the way I define your skepticism is if people, th when people think that, the that there's an alternative out there that's better to membership. The question is they cannot observe that alternative. So my entire book is about how do they benchmark that alternative? How do they, how do they try to get to that alternative? How do they make perceptions about what that alternative could be, right? So it's very intuitive in the sense that if you think about how the Brexit debate was won, right? So by saying, you know, the grass is greener on the other side when we leave, right? Also interesting to remember that the, that this, that the Brexit referendum was not the first referendum on the EU and Britain. You had a referendum in 1975. The, the national context in 1975 couldn't have been diametrically different. Britain was the poor man of Europe. It had IRA bombings. It had energy shortages. 
it had rations on electricity, rations on electricity, it looked way worse than your EU, than at that moment in time, six member states, right? And that moment in time, people had the idea that, that they might gain something from joining that group. Fast forward 2016, the Eurozone looks like it's in trouble. The Euro is, is, uh, is, uh, is underperforming vis-a-vis -vis the pounds. British industry is doing well, and many people have the idea that Europe is holding them back. And that's the kind of intuition that I work with. So, this side. so now, I style, I said, let's put all benefits on one dimension. Well, probably people don't only think about one dimension. So we have had political theorists, so philosophers, political philosophers that have thought about this. Uh, you can get it all from really earlier, but it was really put forward in the work of Dow, a, J a Yale political theorist, professor based there, that makes a distinction between the way people look at, uh, at, uh, at the way they're governed is on based on two dimensions. They care about what they get, so how good are the policies, what are the policy benefits, the outcomes, but they also care about how they're governed. That's something that, by the way, the Brexiteers fully understood. How they're governed, what I mean by that is that the system is fair, so even though the outcomes are not so good now, they might become good in the future. Or to make sure that I have good outcomes now, they are going to sustainably good, be good in the future. If you're in a country, my husband is Spanish, you can totally agree to that, uh, when it has to do with the Barcelona's corruption scandal, right? If you realize that your country is governed by, by elites that are, that, are that, are, that are taking money from the, fr from the public, people become very, very worried about their political regime, right? Vis-a-vis -vis other countries where quality of government is high. So first has to do with how are you evaluating the outcomes of European integration today and the possible alternative state, which we're gonna talk about how they benchmark that. And the second one has more to do with things like quality of government. So corruption, for example, how does the democracy work? Do they think that the system is working fair? Right? And those two are the, are, the, are the key benefits. So if you then take that difference that I meant, remember? So those people who I think are your skeptic are those that think that the alternative state is better than membership. Those that are supported think that the, that the status quo of membership is better vis-a-vis -vis the alternative state. Right? So if you make those now on two dimensions, you get a two by two, every good book has a two by two, as my advisor always told me. So you get exit skeptics, those that think that there's an alternative out there to membership, which is preferable. So as your intuition already see, I will show also later on, those are the ones that will vote out in a referendum, those are the ones that support hardier skeptic parties. Then those that think that any alternative to member state is gonna be worse, right? So any other option was gonna be worse. So those are gonna be your loyal supporters. Where would put the Portuguese population on average? There. Put the British population, well, I mean, it's actual, with actual data, the British population in 2014 was already in the excellent quadrant. But what is interesting, that many people don't, also who, are your, who can be your skeptic, depends on glass half full, half empty, how you would perceive them or classify them, are not really sure what to think. So they like certain aspects of European integration, but they don't like others. So, for example, they're regime skeptics. So they take someone like, I don't know how much you follow that, Jürgen Habermas, the political philosopher, who says that the European Union is a good idea, but the execution of it is not good. It's not democratic enough, basically, right? So he, li he thinks that there's no alternative to, on the policy side, but he thinks that there's an alternative on the regime side, i.e. that there could be a better system that works fairer. Or policy skeptics, those people that actually think that the regime is quite fine, but the policy coming out of it is not that good. Many average Italians are there, right? So that they think that the, the, they have, don't have an issue with the, with the EU as such at the moment, but they don't like what the EU is doing. And that's also what you saw actually in many bailout better states, right, in the, in the, in the Eurozone crisis. So that's the kind of four, four types. That's the, th that's the typology. And why I make the typology is because what we know uh, from social psychology and political psychology is that those people who hold less ambivalent attitudes, who are more unified in their position, are clearer what they say, are more likely to vote on the basis of that, and are more likely to find the issue important. So competition is basically between exit skepticism and loyal supporters. So loyal supporters would be someone like Macron, right, who is you know, pushing forward. Exit skepticism is someone like Farage, right? But actually, those people who are policy skeptics and regime skeptics, those were what I show in the book, those were the people who swung towards leave because they were not so clear what to say. They were very susceptible of what politicians told them to believe because we know that those who are more ambivalent are more susceptible to what we call party queuing, what's going around them. 
but also they might vote sometimes on the EU and sometimes not. They're, they're less likely to always vote on the basis of EU considerations. So these have major behavioral consequences. You see much more behavioral consequences for the, for, the, for the diagonal than you see for the off-diagonal, right? And so it's more difficult sometimes also for politicians to target the off-diagonal, right? Because it's not so sure what to talk about. So if you talk about one thing, you lose the other side, right? So then, the key question that I haven't addressed yet is, well, it's nice, stylized, right? So it's about the difference between the status quo versus the alternative state. But how do people consider the alternative state? So when, so when, do, when can I actually start defining them as Eurosceptic or not? So I suggest that there's three, th I, well, I do in the book and, and one more recent paper, that people use three ways to benchmark the alternative state. They use the present. So they basically extrapolate existing conditions to the future. We're doing well now will do well in the future. Past experiences, that has to do often with war memory, the idea that, that in the past, you know, the alternative to, 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 to European integration, which is very much a peace project, is that it would be conflict, so, that, so the cost of leaving that is too great. And the experience of others, Brexit, right? So Brexit has put a break on exit skepticism because people now see that the alternative state doesn't look that good, <laughs> right? So therefore, and that's what I show in the book, actually I had the manuscript ready before Brexit. Brexit fits very nicely in my benchmarking. So it, it took a little bit more time to add that, to put the data collection in. Uh, so I'm not going to give you everything. So the, the, the book both has aggregate data at the aggregate level and at the individual level. I'll give you just a little bit of an intuition for some of these things, yeah? If there are any questions or things that are unclear, then let me know. So this is basically how people are benchmarking the alternative state. Uh, and I'll also show you a little bit about why I think, the, even though it was very close, why the Brexiteers campaign was more successful than the, than the Remain campaign. So a big part of the book is that people extrapolate from current conditions to the alternative state, right? So I said that already in the difference between the 1975 referendum in Britain versus the 2016 referendum, right? So, if economic conditions are good or people perceive them as such, the viability of the alternative state increases. So my theory comes up with the exact opposite prediction to the, int to the interest explanation, right? It suggests that actually growth in the EU can, seeds, can, can sow the seeds for people possibly thinking that, that they can leave the EU behind. The image that I try to use in popular media is the following. The EU is a tree. It grows, took a little bit of time for the, for the single market to come out, and it starts bearing fruit, especially in northern member states that were open markets and that could benefit a lot. People take the fruit and then they don't think that they need the tree anymore. And they definitely don't want to water the tree for other countries to get, to, to get the fruits. So that's the type of thing I t I'm talking about. Also, if quality of government is high or people perceive it as such, also the viability of the alternative state increases. Right? Because that comes from my theory, right? So if you think about benefit, if you think about policy, you think about regime, if you think, if you extrapolate current conditions into the future, then al the alternative state will look better. The better the regime is doing now, the better the economy is doing now vis-a-vis -vis the EU average, right? And I use European, Pedro's going to be happy about that, I I'm going to use European social survey data to do, to do that. So if you then, and I, I show very much that people do this, that they extrapolate current conditions into the future. And if you, would, if you then have the same questions about current conditions and, and, and questions about how people perceive the EU, you can create these, these differentials that I talked about, right? So the alternative state versus status quo. So now the way that people, how I'm measuring the alternative state is by people's evaluations of the present, right? And this is what the, on average, the EU looks like. So for EU, for when I present this in Brussels, they say, oh, no problem, high loyal support. Definitely, that's true, that's the, but that's no longer the majority. Yeah? It used to be, actually in earlier times I showed, it used to be the majority. So now you see many more people in the Eurosceptic camp, but actually you see many more people being ambivalently Eurosceptic, so liking the regime, not liking the policies, liking the policies, not liking the regime. I'm partly a trained political psychologist, no surprise to me, most people hold very ambivalent positions about things. Right? It's never that clear. But that also shows you that in a referendum campaign, these people can, sw can be swung, right? Depending on how you frame. Exit skepticism is not the highest, but still considerable. So if people are extrapolating current conditions to the future, you should see 
that exit skepticism, for example, or any other form of skepticism should be higher when current conditions are better. So the way I, what I do now is I take the good versus economic conditions are taken from the World Bank data, or Eurostat data, doesn't matter, and I look at our, our countries above the EU average or below the EU average. Right? That's the way I define good. There's different ways how I define it. But so what you see is that in conditions that are bad, loyal support by far outranks everything else. Because if your country is not doing well, how do you think you will do if you are outside the EU? Right? That's the kind of uh, intuition. That when countries are doing very well, they start flirting with the idea, well, maybe we can do outside. Right? So you see, it's still not the majority, right? I mean, you, you don't have exit skepticism being very high, but it's, it's about four times as high in, uh, in, uh, in good conditions than in, uh, in bad economic conditions. The same when I take quality of government, right? So you already see is that these are two operationalizations of part of these Northern European countries that I talked about, right? That are high on, on economic uh, conditions vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the EU, and they also outrank mostly in quality of government, right? So loyal support much higher in low quality of government environments versus high quality of government. For those of you who are interested in measurement, so this is taken from the Gothenburg group that measure a lot of quality of government on many different scales, and you, you know, it works on different, different ways of thinking about it. So it's basically another way to measure corruption, for example, right, and measure good public, good provision. So what happened in the crisis, so when I show you this, I, I, I didn't put it on, but if I show you this in 2002, which is the first time in the European Social Survey we can, I can give you this type of data, all the countries were crossed, were, were, were a little bit around this, these quadrants. And what happened in the crisis is that countries that did better than the EU average, flocking more towards the Eurosceptic category, when those countries that, that do worse are moving actually into more support or at, uh, are remaining at that level of support. So that would be Portugal, that would be Hungary, that would be Ireland, and the other side, Great Britain or Sweden. If you want to put a gun to my head and say, if there would be another exit referendum, what would it be? On the basis of my data, this is 2014, I would think Sweden. I don't think it's very likely because Sweden is a small country, but right, there's different conditions than the, than the UK and, and Brexit looks so bad, but you see this type of similar sentiment. If any country comes close, it's Sweden. So if you then take this, this, this debate about, you know, being in a, in, a, in, a, in a, so here I say alternative state not viable and viable. Note that it's not my interpretation, it's not an economic interpretation. It's, it's, it's that are, are the conditions better or worse than the EU average? I still think Brexit shows that none of these are probably viable, right? But so what you see is that if the alternative states, if, if conditions, quality of government and economic conditions are good, you see much more support for hard skeptic parties and much more support for less integration, right, when you ask that in the survey. So why do I now have this difference with the interest explanation, right? Remember the interest explanation was about economic conditions are good, you're going to be more supportive. So what I show in several experiments in the book, that that's because the interest explanation hinged on one assumption, that people are attributing the good economic and quality of government decisions to the EU, but I show that they do not. Why do Germans think that they're doing well is because they think that they have good institutions and they are, have, have good car makers, if I put it like that, right? So, and that, and that I thought it would be asymmetric. I thought that it would be in countries that do worse. That it, no, they also blame their governments. They think that they're doing worse because they're not as economically, you know, uh, 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 competitive as they should be and they think that their national systems are not working, working properly. So in that way, the assumption of that interest debate and of many European politicians is that people are attributing all these benefits to the EU, but they're not. The question might be, why are they not? Because A, politicians never tell them to. It's not actually that we find, it's another work that Sarah Holbert, my co-author, did, that people blame the EU so much. We don't find so much evidence for that. What we just find is what Marina described about the Portuguese elections, that people don't talk about the EU, or when they talk about something good, it's because their government did really well. Right? And when they're doing bad, the opposition is saying their, their government is... So it's very nationalized. So it's not a surprise that people are attributing a lot of that to their nation state because there's no European public sphere, there's no European discussion. A lot of this is national. Right? So just to explore a little bit more, but for the sake of time. So what I did also is this hinges on the fact that that differential, remember that I did, the status quo versus the alternative state, that it really moves with real world conditions. Right? Because if it doesn't really move with real world conditions, what are we really measuring? 
So what I do here is I use real events that happen in the European Social Survey and that are in somewhat a quasi-experiment. So a corruption scandal in the European Parliament, a corruption scandal nationally. Does that make people then more, so you would expect that a, that a corruption sc scandal nationally makes people more uh, uh, pro-EU, whereas an European corruption scandal makes them less pro-EU, right? Because it's always about that relationship. And I show that that's exactly what happens. Not huge effects, but effects. And these are things that I didn't design. These are, you know, things from the, so, so we see that these differentials work in the way that they did. So just looking at EU support is just not enough. You also really have to bring them next to national evaluations. So as I already mentioned, benchmarking was also crucial in the campaign in, 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 in the United Kingdom. I've been kind of told that maybe this is too, I was living in the UK, I was in Oxford at the time when I wrote the book. This is, you know, like, I, of course, my thinking has also probably been influenced by that. But you saw this really going on the Brexit referendum. So I'll give you the, let's, we send two, uh, 350 million to the EU, let's fund the NHS instead, right, the, the famous red bus. And the other side, uh, uh, Cameron saying, we're going to lose per family. 4,300 pounds if we leave the EU. And this is really, this is not about do you like the EU or not, this is just what's gonna happen if we leave, right? So what I also show is that those people who think that Brexit will be really bad are much more supportive of remaining within the EU, they're much more less likely to be your skeptic. Uh, the reverse, of course, for Brexit being negative, I also did this in an experiment because you could think, okay, this is all related to each other, also did this in an experimental setting. So the people who think that Brexit is, is, is doing really bad become, as a result, more pro-EU. They see this, they're benchmarking that alternative state and think, oh, wow, this is actually not that good. Even exit skeptics, right, even those that are, so this is just to show you that in a, so this is also quite nice because I had a panel, the same people, being interviewed in April 2016 and being interviewed in August 2016. So this is asking you, would you want to remain in the European Union? And you see across the board, across the four different types that I distinguish, that in, you see like a, a slight increase in August, right? So that as people see the first fallout, the pound drops, there's uh, a camera breaks down, you know, like the, there's a political and economic uncertainty and support for the EU. And actually this has gone up even more, right? As Brexit looks worse and worse and worse, the support for the EU goes up. However, it's, they might, that doesn't mean that everybody just loves Europe, right? So there's still policy skeptics, there's still regime skeptics, but at least they want to remain in the EU. So the last way in which people can benchmark, and then I'll say something in the last part about, uh, about, uh, about what I think this means for the future of the EU, is that they can use the past to benchmark. There's several ways in which you can use the past. In Portugal, there might be, a, I, I, I'm fully aware that there might be national ways in which that's done. Right? This is a country that is, you know, has, has rec well, not recently, but decades ago was a dictatorship, the same as, as, uh, as Spain was. Spain seems to have, you know, is still more legacy of that. Uh, yesterday, Franco, of course, was, uh, the, the, the body was taken out of the grave. But th there are national considerations about what the past is. <laughs> but in Europe, often the past is about the war, right? The conflict. What type of conflict? Either, you know, on the Iberian Pen Peninsula or about mostly about the Second World War, right? I mean, it's a peace project that's developed as a, as, 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 as never that again. So this is not just something that academics think. This is something that politicians use. This was a, 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 um, a um, campaign ad of the VVD, of the Liberal Party, the current party in government in, uh, in the Netherlands, that said, never again. This was in the constitutional treaty referendum. If you vote against the constitutional treaty referendum, this is what you're gonna get. It got a little bit of, of pushback, but that ad that it was seen as too strong, but it was a clear reference to the war. Also, Helmut Kohl, the most important rule of the new Europe is that there never mu must be violence again. Jean-Claude Juncker, anyone who believes that, he said this recently yeah, to the Brexiteers, anyone who believes that the internal question of war and peace in Europe no longer exists, risks the, 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 uh, of being deeply mistaken. Europe elections will be decisive for the future of our continent. Never since the Second World War has Europe been more essential. Macron, right? So this is really these, these references to this is what the project is about. If we regress from this, we're going to get war. So what I suggest is that what politicians do here is they're creating a negative alternative state, right? They're saying to people, if you leave, there is a possibility of increased conflict, right? So I then try to, to show this by doing a, 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 an experiment where I give some people a vignette about the war, one group, 
And, other, and, then, and then they answer a couple of questions about the EU, and some people get the vignette after they've already answered the questions. So you can look at what the effect of that vignette is. You might say it's not the perfect way of doing it, I probably agree with that, but it's at least one way of doing it, right? So the Second World War has been a global war, lasted 39, 45, blah, 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 right? About the war. It has no reference to Italy, no reference to Germany, because it is not designed to, to cue perpetrators. I make sure also that that's not what's happening. I have a manipulation checks to deal with that. So this vignette increases people's support for the EU in general, for remaining in the EU, but I also wanted to look as, do they want more EU when they get that type of vignette? Well, yes and no. So I look at three questions. So extending rights of EU migrants, so for example, giving them the right to vote in national elections, aiding to a European army, those of you who know the EU say, but Catherine, we're not really talking about a European army, but I need to design a question that works for people that they understand. So a defense union, they have no idea what that means, right? And then financial aid. Would you give financial aid to a member state in need? The only thing that triggers that is financial aid. So people are more willing to, to pay. They're not more willing to fight with each other, not more willing to grant more migrants uh, more rights. It fits my kind of, because the way I conceptualize, of course, it's a bit transactional, right? That it's about the benefits of some towards the other. This also fits this kind of more transactional. You're willing to pay, but not necessarily willing to go much more. And identity uh, uh, considerations are, are, are stronger, probably, in order to withdraw that. So the remaining thing of the book, very clear, I show that these different types that I outlined have very different policy and reform preferences. I already mentioned that. And that they also have very differential behavioral consequences. So, Exit skeptics are your Le Pen supporters, your Geert Wilde supporters, also some on the extreme left, right? Th those could also be uh, the supporters of, of, uh, of especially Syriza on the Farafakis, or the combination with Farafakis, for example, uh, or the left party in Germany, right? It's not just on the, on the right. But many of these more ambivalence, you don't see that they use European integration so much when they decide to vote for an election. So this has different behavioral consequences. It's not so easy to say you're, you're a skeptic, you're gonna vote for these type of parts. It's more complex. So this is kind of what I wanted to say about how I perceive your skepticism, but what I wanted to end on is what does this all mean? All nice and good, but you know, like nice intellectual exercise, but, uh, but what does this mean? So the number one thing for the EU is that if Brexit will ever become a success, which might never happen, we might never see Brexit, <laughs> but on the, on the short term we might see five years of real economic decline, but if the EU, if, if the UK will look good in 10 years from now, the pound will be strong, economic growth will be high, we still have the possibility of contagion risk. That some member states think, hmm, we can go it alone. The EU, that's why I fundamentally agree with Juncker that Brexit is a lose-lose for the EU. Because it shows you that you can leave, so that's always gonna be an option, and you might, depending on what's gonna happen, but in, you might, for the for, for coming decades, have an emeritus member state on your shores against which people will benchmark the EU as success forever. So I don't think that Brexit will be a success in terms of that, that the UK will be more equal. Probably not. But if it becomes a kind of Singapore in the Thames that does well economically, you know, you're gonna see the discussions in the Netherlands changing or discussions in, in Sweden changing, right? So then you might have an issue of a European Union that it ha faces a problem of adverse selection. That if it's true that you are more likely to become Eurosceptic when the alternative looks, less, uh, uh, looks more viable, and you do that by extrapolating from the present, then where are you gonna see pushes for disintegration and against the EU are gonna be in rich member states of the North, right? And then, of course, the only way in which we can deal with structural imbalances in the EU is by redistributing somewhere. But that's exactly going to be unpopular in elections in the North. So it's a real conundrum for, you know, Macron. So take, take Macron. Oh, pro-EU, pro-EU. Well, let's not uh, uh, have any North Macedonians or Albanians in the EU, because he knows that that's going to be fuel on the fire of Rassemblée Nationale, of Le Pen. So it's a really delicate balance for these countries to be in. So what do we also, um, how do we make membership attractive for all? So there's also a lot of push now uh, for two speeds, right? So moving ahead in some group and not in the others. So if you believe, if you, if you buy my story about the status quo versus the alternative state, if you make the, the status quo look worse for Poland, you could also fuel your skepticism. So if Poland would become the second group, that actually people are like, well, 
okay, the alternative state is bad, but you know, the status quo is not that good either. So you have to also be careful to not to make the status quo look too bad for certain member states, right? So that would also be a very tricky uh, element. Also, it's a very cautionary tale for the UK, because what Marina said, you know, Brexit, but Brexit has just started. The actual action is still gonna come in trade negotiations. Also, we don't know if the EU will be as united on trade negotiations. The Netherlands is much more affected by Brexit than this country will be, right? So there's different, much more differentiation again about what national stories are about the EU. So this notion of benchmarks will be, is, is really teaches us something about international cooperation. That this is a fundamental, perhaps, problem of international cooperation. That if you get the fruits of international cooperation, remember the tree, you, you pick the fruit, you think you don't need the tree anymore. If we don't solve this issue that people really understand where some of those benefits are coming from and that national politicians start talking honestly about why they are able to achieve certain benefits and that the EU plays a crucial role in that, you know, we're fueling more your skepticism in the future, especially in countries that do well. So it's not just a problem of the EU, it's a fundamental problem, I, I agree with Jacques Delors, it's also a fundamental problem about how the EU is incorporated in national systems. But of course, a national politician wants to win a national election, has no interest in, in except for Macron perhaps, to, 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 to buy, sell any big ideas about Europe, right? So it, it, I, I don't blame national politicians, but it is part of the problem as well. And also, that elite rhetoric is crucial, which is some of the next uh, work that I'll do on, is that this idea, if it's about constructing an alternative state, and if it's not really about how true that alternative state is, right, you can get very far, far with these mantras of taking back control, we're going to make Europe great again. Those are all about there is something that used to be better, and I'm going to give that back to you, which we probably know that that's unlikely, but it is very, many people are very susceptible to that type of rhetoric. So it's also important for, for the other side, if you will, to get up with, uh, with an alternative to that. And I think the, 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 the last thing is that a lot of work has been about economic grievances, which I think are crucial, which is this left behind communities, right? That, that fuel uh, 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 hostility towards international cooperation. But in my book, I show that this viability of the alternative state might lead to strange bedfellows, which I think was exactly the Brexit coalition. Those that are poor, any change to the status quo might be better, right? They're gonna be poor anyway. That's, that's the kind of, the baseline prediction. Those who are rich are so rich that any risk is they're going to be buffered out. So you get the Jacob rees mogg together with the, with the person in, in, in Sunderland, right? Which, which would not necessarily be the, the, the clearest bet for us. But from my perspective, in terms of viability of the alternative state, it's less risky to risk it, right? Either you have nothing, you have so little that you cannot lose, or you have so much that you will never lose, right? So that creates, I think, this is what I already said. So it might lead to some, I think that's the last point I want to make, to some par a paradoxical process underlying your international cooperation, the sense that increasing benefits associated with more political and economic integration across borders might over time become this risk hexing me mechanism that allows populations and individuals to turn against international government in the first place. So they, that actually they grow on the European integration or they grow on the international cooperation and then they don't think they need it anymore. And that's the kind of thing that I think is crucial. So they're also elite rhetoric in trying to understand and, and, and making clear what an alternative would really look like is going to be crucial. So those are, I think, the kind of takeaway points for international cooperation more generally from my book. Anyway, that was it from my side. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for your very insightful and uh, I think challenging, uh, challenging talk. And uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions, but perhaps I can start myself in order to break the ice uh, with two, uh, two questions. The first, uh, uh, the first question I'd like to ask is that you present uh, three reasons uh, for this uh, construction of alternative states. So first of all, there is the present circumstances. Uh, second of all, you have the past. And then third, 
it would be the benchmarking across other countries, right, which would be the Brexit. But you, you, I don't know if it's in the book, but I wanted to know what is the hierarchy that you give to these three issues? What, which one matters more? You speak a lot about Brexit, but how are these related? And is there a point where Brexit goes so badly that we don't have to worry about the present economic circumstances or uh, the contrary? If the status quo deteriorates so much, uh, you could get uh, hardcore levers even in countries where alternative status quo would normally wouldn't work. So that's the f that would be the first question. And the second question is your, uh, your narrative about the fact, sure, uh, about the fact that actually uh, citizens don't look at the EU for policy making, they only consider the national institutions. <laughs> okay, so I don't, I mean, I buy that partially, but I would put to you that actually with the Eurozone crisis and with all this, the Eurozone crisis was a learning experience, experiment where a lot of citizens understood that the levers of economic policy making were with the European Central Bank and the European Commission and were not with the national government. Of course, time goes by and people may have forgotten that, but we also know that uh, all the decisions to solve the crisis structurally have been in the direction of more supranational governance and less for national governments. So to what extent this story that you tell for the aggregate population is different if you consider political sophistication, if you consider people who are informed about Europe, mm -hmm. and also to what extent is that what you're saying about people not understanding that Europe matters for decision making, uh, also uh, dependent, I mean, the, it's temporary, this will become completely outdated because the process of European integration is such that it has, its nature has changed fundamentally through the Eurozone integration, uh, through EMU. So those would be my two points. And if, and I wouldn't ask you, do you want, uh, I'll, I'll, I would, I would, uh, we would gather some more questions if people have uh, immediately. Uh, that they have, yes, please, I would just ask you to, one, say your name, and two, uh, be brief, okay? Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Michael Pekanich, Polish. Uh, uh, Paul Miguel Madeira, I am from IGOT, but also now from ICS at a project. I have a question. Um, well, about uh, the level of analysis, because you always talk about uh, countries and um, the, your analysis countries, countries that are uh, good or not so good, doing so good, and um, perceptions of alternative states, but by countries. In a, uh, a context in which inequalities are rising fast and fast, um, how does class fit into this? Because people in a well-doing country may not have been doing so well for long ago. So that's uh, the question. And um, also about uh, the, the uh, a kind of decline of uh, the Euro Europe in the world. That may also be a question. Uh, well, apparently we have a lot of cooperation with the EU, although it may be problematic that it's only about cooperation. EU, but uh, at the same time, Europe is decaying economically and politically, and so on. Thank you. Thank you for your conference. My name is Answer is Sociologist. <coughs> but I think the first problem is the economy for society. Because the role of economy in the society is very important for election, the parliament, and for policy. The first is economy, and about for policy in the country. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, thank you very much. I mean, wh wh when you started saying, okay, I think uh, euroscepticism should be seen as a relational character, I say, wow, great. I mean, I, 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 really, I, I think this is a really powerful uh, framework. But so I would like to ask you about what this framework leaves out, which is the relation with politics, with different political perspectives. That, that, what? Ideology. Yeah, ideology, yeah, political stances, etc. Because, I mean, like, uh, they, they, I think the risk here is following the rational actor trap, you know, like I'm benchmarking, so I'm deciding. But, I mean, there are some who think that Europe is a problem because it has Frontex. Others think that Europe is a problem because it, it has not... Frontex is not strong enough, which may also mean that in terms of policies that we may do to increase the, the will of people to be... And for instance, on the right side, you know, there has been a, a recent convincing studies that places that uh, are perceived as being left behind do matter for the geography of vote to the far right, which is partially coincident with euroscepticism because well, I, I would say that maybe left-wing euroscepticism is less represented in parliaments because, I mean, all the euroscepticists I know, they don't vote. All left euroscepticists will. So I would say, you know, is there a risk that by just looking at one, you know, personal or national interest dimension, we lose other cleavages within that group of euroscepticists? Otherwise, maybe I'm getting a bit overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, is, is it okay? If I, yeah, sorry, we'll, sorry. We'll otherwise, have I'm good. Exactly. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try. Quickly. I'll try to be short. Sorry, I always have a tendency to speak fast. I'm enthusiastic, but uh, so with regard to the ideology, so what's so I, I think that's a very so so I, I don't share your cons I, I I don't share the idea that uh, that. Uh, that uh, left-wing your skepticism is not explicit. It's it's very explicit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe, but but I, I think it's it's very explicit. It's been extremely strong in the French left, for example, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's been much more problematic for the French government than for a long time, right? So so it, it, I think we have to be careful with that. Uh, but but the the relationship with ideology. Um, so I I know that that's the lens in in which we want to see things a lot. Uh, and left-right ideology, but I don't think that the way people identify with politics is necessarily always so easily fit in those two ideologies that you suggest. So you get actually a combination in which you have people on the extreme left and the extreme right, which in my category actually fall in the same category and want to leave the EU and therefore, so that's why a lot of, when I present this for more social democratic parties, they don't like it because it's, it, go, it, it splits their constituency partly, right? So I think that's not always the case. There is indeed affinity. So if, I w if you put a gun to my head and I would have to make, you find more extreme right under the exit skeptics, but you also find extreme left. But for different reasons, right? So, but the interesting element is that actually a message of take back control works for both. Because if you want to have austerity, you want to take back control from Europe. Because, I mean, if you want to ke keep in, I mean, and that, that, that was the message. I'm not saying it's right, but that was the message of a lot of extreme left parties. Think about Podemo, uh, uh, sorry, Syriza in, uh, in, uh, in, in Greece, which is not representative for every left-wing Eurosceptic party. So in, in, in that way, there are, so I agree with you that there might be some distinctions, but I think actually we focus too much on that distinction and we, d and we don't focus a lot on that people actually sometimes that we find elements which break through existing patterns of ideology and that can help us understand why you get Brexit in a way, you get strange bedfellows and you get this, it doesn't mean that ideology doesn't matter, but I think I, I try to be a bit provocative in, in trying to make that argument. Um, so, so that's also with the, with the relationship uh, to, uh, I'm going to take two things, one on, on class and also about the role of, of the economy, which, which relates a little bit maybe to what was said before. So yes, so this is, so I presented national analysis, the entire book has individual level analysis. So I would control for class, I would control for a lot of things, and there's still something to be said for the kind of categories that I, uh, that I outline. So think about the, f so, so I, I said this kind of strange bad fellows, right? So think about the situation, and, and I don't know how familiar you, you guys are with, with a kind of national element of being in and out, which is the Catalan independence. So what you see with Catalan independence is that where there is a lot of resistance to Catalan independence is in the squeezed middle class because they have something to lose when, when, the, when the status quo goes out. I would say that that's, uh, that's exactly the same analysis that I find 
for, for, for your skepticism. So the very rich and the very poor are those that, are, that would try the risk of leaving because they're going to be rich, poor, no matter what. The squeezed middle class have something considerably to lose, right, by, by changing anything in the, in the, in the status quo. So in that way, that's, that's, that's the case. But we focus very much, to be fair, we focus very much on le uh, left behind places. And of course, inequality is terrible. But there are also many people who are just getting by, who are just kind of fine. And any form of, of status class sh shift would be a lot. So I think we're oftentimes not focusing enough on the squeezed middle class in the way that we think about that, which is, which is also another way of thinking about class, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and then about the economics, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that one element is really important that what this, I think, does show that even though I wish that I could solve every problem by an economic grievance, I think that, to, to your response to you as well, that some people are willing, also in Brexit, if you ask them, even if you lose money, would you still vote for Brexit? And they say yes. So you can say, okay, they're, they're, they're stupid, they don't really understand what they're going on, but for some people, it is that to be, to be governed by your own people is something that they find very feel very strongly about. So, so I think capturing everything back to economics is difficult. However, one and we've talked about this. I'm also not suggesting at all because you don't see that, that there's a lot of identity featuring here at all. That I think the, that that the EU there is not a lot of identi identified feeling with the EU, right? It's because people don't feel extremely European. They feel primarily first national. Therefore, when, when they question something, it might lead them to question the EU as such, because they don't necessarily identify with that so much. But I, think, I don't think that, that your skepticism comes from refugee problems or comes from intra-EU migration. Or, that's way too simple. So I, 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 don't, and I think there's no evidence to, 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 to suggest that. I just think that, that, that those kind of messages can be really important for those people who don't really know what to think and are a bit worried about their future, then they think, oh yes, yes, that Pole that came and lived in my <laughs> neighborhood, I actually have an issue with them. Even though themselves, they don't might feel, really feel an issue with them. So I think it's a really useful political st strategic tool, but I don't think that it's driving everything that we're, we're, that we're, that we're discussing. Then coming, sorry, very shortly to the questions that, uh, that Marina raised. Uh, yes, so, so I, I really want to say that's important for me to qualify. It's not that people are not attributing any responsibility to the EU. Clearly, in the Eurozone crisis, the attribution to the EU has increased. But still, when you compare the two, so I, I have also analysis where I show people who really lost money or, or a house or things that had real consequences of, of, of the Eurozone crisis, they still attribute that more to the nation state than to the EU. So it's a question of, of degree. So it could very well be what you suggest, that if there's another crisis where the EU acts in the same way, you know, th th that might change. So it could be that in 10 years, someone else needs to write a book and say, you know, Catalina is totally outdated. It's the but the interesting thing is that I also thought that political sophistication, but I've done so much analysis, there's no difference. And I think that the reason is because really we think primarily, when we think about politics, we primarily think people when they make up their minds through the prism of, of, of politics. You might not, I might not, because of, but, but most people on average do. And then with the hierarchy of the alternative state. So what I find, which is also clear from the data, is that the past works the least well. So this references to the, w to the war and so on, it seems, yes, the past, it just is too far behind. Some generations might be more receptive, but not so much. So the question really is, what is stronger? The Brexit, I, I cannot give you an answer, you know, the alternative state versus present. But the, it is clearly that now Brexit has stopped some richer member states thinking that they can go it alone because it looks so bad. How long that will be, how far that will be, I don't know. I'll put them now at the same level and then see what, what, what reality brings, yeah. Hello, uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Jieling, uh, I'm a doctoral student here. Uh, I'm Chinese, so for, uh, your presentation really uh, gave me a big picture of the uh, European Union and that, thank you. So I have two probably very simple questions for you. Uh, so there is this argument of that, uh, the no so the northern countries, rich countries that are tired of they, they are more skeptic because they think that, that they've been given more subsidies to the south and uh, seeing the kind of development taking place than they desired. And, uh, but uh, 
it, it's very, but it's not so much mentioned or discussed that uh, they got rich also thanks very much to the increasing sales and other resources from the South, right? So why do you think uh, caused this uh, lack of discussion on this very matter? And the second is, um, I wonder if you think there is any uh, similarity or does it resembles at all this north-south relationship to the Brexit EU or EU Brexit relationship? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I understand you, but... Yeah, okay, okay. well, that's very loud. <laughs> so uh, I was wondering how geographic position comes into play there. So, for example, either very small countries like Malta or Luxembourg or countries that are strategically positioned in the global trade network like the Netherlands mm -hmm. with the port of Rotterdam, which is one of the biggest ports in the world, and being located on the mouths of three navigable rivers that pass through foreign industrial cities. Uh, does that affect in any has has that variable been taken into uh, into account? I was fascinated by your typology and the amb ambivalent skepticism, and especially the relationship between that that could be established between that and what happens in referendums. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a strong danger that it can be managed and manipulated in order to, uh, 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 and the referendums, in fact, a very mm. bad instrument from that point of view. Could you talk to us a little bit? Yeah. On the other hand, ambivalent skepticism is probably uh, uh, increasing mm. in, in, the, in the richer countries. Mm. So uh, I'd mm -hmm. like to hear you on, mm -hmm. on that. Thank you. Working, yes. I see, yes. I'd just like to pick up on the intra European cohesion issue and the link with Euroscepticism, just to ask whether there's been attempts at looking at Euroscepticism at the border regions inside Europe, just going a, a little bit micro, either experimental or uh, survey data collected in the border regions for the very reasons of the typology that you've mentioned, the regime policy issue. So, policy will have. Uh, uh, cohesion uh, policy issues and uh, in terms of regime we have all kinds of identities uh, historical state formation etc uh, at the borderline Thank you. so, so I, I will take the the, the first and, the, and then the last question as a follow-up so I, I I will I will um, I think I think what I got from your question so so one way in which I also try to, when I discuss the different puzzles that we could have, is that well, maybe because this interest explanation about how well you do was you know, done way before the Eurozone crisis, that what we should be really focusing on is creditor and debtor relationships, and that drives it. No, because you see your skepticism in, in, in um, so that will be that, that you would have your skepticism always in kind of creditor countries, right? So what you see is that you have your, you have, a country that actually is the biggest creditor country, which is Luxembourg, where your skepticism doesn't play a role at all. So it's not as easy, or in some other countries where Sweden is very eurosceptic, but Denmark is not, where actually their contributions to the SAM would be very similar. So, so, so there's something more going on than just creditor or, or debtor, debtor relationships. It is a, is a part of that because it, it, it's, of course, it frames the alternative state, or it actually, more importantly, it frames the status quo. So it tells people, hey, the status quo has just become worse. That's, I think, what Dutch uh, populist politicians that did. They were bailing out Greece, and they never talk about the fact that, you know, the Bertelsmann Foundation, which, um, which uh, uh, is a German foundation, that I, uh, politically independent foundation that I work with as well, we've done a survey, and actually the region that has benefited, two regions that have benefited the most from European integration is Amsterdam, Rotterdam, that's that area, because, of course, you know, you said it, but the ports and, uh, and everything. 
and the other one is, is, is uh, Zurich, which is not actually in the EU. Uh, next year, they'll be very interesting because they're going to redo their, uh, their free movement of people referendum, which if they vote against out, it will, you know, will deal with a lot of, of, of relationships. We're going to have another Brexit type of not a member state, but we're going to have a very difficult relationship with Switzerland if that would be the case. Um, so, so, so you see this, this I, think, I think that, and that's actually not just myself, but behavioral economists have shown that, it's, that people are much more um, attentive to costs than they are to benefits. And I think that the benefits of European integration are not always that tangible to people. And if they especially don't attribute those things to the EU, or less so, let me be, be precise with the qualification that Marina made, then you can get these situations. So I've written once in the Dutch newspaper, you know, the EU has been a bargain for the, e for, for the Netherlands. It's been, you know, we've just benefited tremendously from that. It was the sick man of Europe in the 1970s. It's one of the most wealthy areas of the EU today, right? And, but that's easily forgotten. And that relates a bit to the, you know, uh, border regions and these kind of things. Yes, we know from uh, work of uh, one of my colleagues, Teresa Kuhn, that border regions are more, more pro-EU on average. Um, and that's, but the, the issue is that I don't fully understand is because it's that they think that the status quo of their country is worse, that they, they are actually getting something from the EU and they're a little bit more peripheral in their own countries or, or what's exactly going on uh, uh, there or if it's some identity or socialization. And there's some economists in Zurich who are working on that. So they have a nice paper <coughs> trying to identify this, but, but yeah, we don't really know yet why that's the case for border regions. Then the geographical, look, I already, met, you know, I, I already uh, answered it a little bit. But I do think that, 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 as I said, from my typology, Sweden comes the closest in 2014 to the sentiment that you saw in the UK. Um, but of course, Sweden is a very small country, right? However, Brexit would be less complicated for Sweden, probably. You know, an exit, Switzerland would be less complicated because it's because of the, 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 they could do a deal like Norway, probably. I don't know if that would be the easiest. They don't have the Northern Irish border issue. So, so in that way, even though they're a small country, they could say, well, we can become like Norway, right? So, so it, it's not only that it's so easy. So I, I think that, that European elites have to be a bit careful with making, oh, it will never happen in these small to open economies. I'm, a, I'm an academic. I want to be open to all possible. I don't think it's, 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 the, it's the most likely outcome, but I think there is, uh, there is some probability of that happening if Brexit at a, at a, at a, at a certain time would look better. I mean, at this moment in time, <laughs> that's not the case, right? Um, then, oh yeah, sorry, your question about ambivalence. So, so I, I think that that's, I actually it's something that, uh, that, um, that a lot of, uh, that we sh as political behaviors or people who look at elections should take more, more careful notice of, even in, in national elections, right? That people don't, that people consider many more parties, that they're not so sure what to think. In some ways you could say, well, the increase in ambivalence is good for the EU. Because that's a maturation of opinion. Mm -hmm. That you can say also, I like certain things, I don't like certain things. Mm -hmm. That's probably how people would view Portugal. I like certain things, I don't like certain things. However, in the EU, as I, as I suggested, there is this lack of, of core identification with Europe. So therefore, it becomes more complicated. Because as soon as they say, like, what have you done for me lately? And they say, oh, not so good on the policy side. They think, oh, let's get rid of the EU. No one would say, oh, let's get rid of Portugal, right? I mean, so, so, so there is a little bit of that issue that, that ambivalence is maybe more complicated in the EU that it will be na in nation, nation member states for this reason, that it goes often to a more system critique, that you have this tendency mm -hmm. that it might go to exit skepticism in the end. But I, I do think that Brexit has, has put a break on that. But I think therefore referenda, so I will just say that I was, uh, some other people who were involved in, in, in uh, in advising David Cameron, and I told, I and others told him, do not hold a referendum on this. Because A, 10 of the, in the last international cooperation across the world, in the last decade, that 50% of the, of the referendums have gone negative. So it's a 50-50 chance, right? Of, of, so I'm talking about, uh, about uh, referendums in Costa Rica. It's across the world on international cooperation. So it's 50-50. And the fact that, you know, in any, I don't have to tell it to political scientists, but it was, you have a political business cycle, as we call, so governments are really popular at the, at the beginning, the honeymoon period, and then they get more popular at the end because they start spending at the end of the electoral cycle. He held it in the middle of, an electro, of, of a government cycle. So many people were, were worried about austerity, they were angry also at a, a little bit at the government. So, so therefore, they were not necessarily angry about the UK, they liked the UK very much, but they, they, they were angry with Cameron. So then he was also the worst ambassador of Remain, right, in some ways. So it, it created, it's, it's very difficult. 
and I think the in and out really makes these people, um, these, these people, you know, it forces them to take a position where they often would be more yeah. ambivalent, right? And in a, so th that's a real difficult case. And I think the other thing is that, I don't know how you see it, but I think the Remain, uh, uh, the Remain side only spoke to the mind. It was only about, about the cost of living. The, 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 bre the Leave side spoke to the heart and the mind. So it said, we're gonna make more money by out, but we're also gonna have pride of Britain, right? So if, if you think that identities are important and that interests are important, and it's also about that people wanna be, you know, proud of their regimes, they were also catering towards these other, other considerations, that it's to protect British sovereignty, it's to protect mm -hmm. British judges. Of course, this was lip service, because as soon as the politicians could, they started turning against the parliament, against judges, right? But, but nonetheless, I think this was in the, in, in the campaign was very strong. Mm -hmm. say that the Remain sign campaigned only on the mind because they didn't, they weren't aware that Britain, the British people had a heart and fought with the heart <laughs> for the <laughs> referendum. Maybe that's why. Yeah. So, uh, we have a question here. Anyone else want to put their arm up? We have time for a few more questions. I'm, uh, my name is Rui Vinhas. I work in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Congratulations for the presentation. Uh, just Two, two sh very brief questions. The first is, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, national governments, national politicians, national political parties, uh, middle class, lower class, high class, but you never mentioned in your thesis, in your equation, uh, the, the role of the European institutions. Do they have any role? Is that on purpose? Do you think they, they, <laughs> they have any, can have any positive or negative role? They should be reformed, act in another way? This is a question. The second it's a question slash comment, uh, it's about Brexit. I, I fully agree with you that it's still in the beginning and, uh, and it's already a high quality Netflix series. And yes, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's still in the beginning. But one of, one of the things that uh, I, I, I usually don't, don't, don't listen or don't see mentioned is the, in the, from the side of the benefits, it's the, the single market. Mm -hmm. The single market is probably, the, and the Brexit put it in, in an evidence, that it's the, the, the main benefit of being part or, be, or having access to the single market is probably the most important uh, issue and probably the, most, the issue that will prevent, at least in a, some, some way, the future exits. So this is also sort of a question if you agree with this or uh, why don't you incorporate that in your analysis? Thank you. So, so, so definitely the the let me let me tackle the last thing first about the the, the single market. Definitely. So, I, I think that is crucial. I just think that many people are not are not fully attributing this to the EU, right? So they they, they think that that Germany is doing well because their car makers are doing well, but they don't really understand the single market. They might be starting to understand it now because of Brexit. But that has become clearer. That we're talking about that way more than we did before. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops in the future. However, and that was the question about Sweden, uh, the answer to Sweden, we have to be careful in the EU not to extrapolate the Brexit exit to possible other exits. Because why is Britain so, why is the British exit so complicated? Well, it, I sometimes call it the empire strikes back, right? So they, one of the reasons for, the em for, for a lot of people to vote was this idea that wow, we're an empire. I was at Oxford at the time, and people would say like, you know, but we have been able to deal with these issues before. We were a big, a big power and so on, right? Maybe, you know, I don't have to talk to Portuguese or to Dutch people that, you know, if you were a big power sometimes, it doesn't mean that you're a big power necessarily today, right? But the, 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 the Brits have this very strong. I think that they think that they, I would probably say, overestimate their influence in the world, um, however influential they are. But I think the major issue for the single market and why it's so complicated to do the deal is not that there could be some Norway solution. There can be some Norway solution, but the hard Brexiteers don't want it because they want to strike Brexit trade deals with other nations, right? That's, that's their, their goal. We cannot understand that, but that's become probably because they want to deregulate and therefore they want to, if you want to deregulate in the way that, that hard Brexiteers want, the single market is a liability for you. It's not, a, it's not an asset. We, you know, 
you and I probably would agree that that's some fantasy, but I think that's really what they think. And the other element is that they have, uh, that they have the, the Good Friday Agreement. That's what I mean, uh, you know, Empire Strikes Back. They simply forgot about the Northern Irish border. And that has been now very clear. David Cameron has kind of said that in his, in his, in his memoirs. And that will be, of course, that's much less complicated for Sweden or for some other countries because you don't have this peace problem on the, on the Northern Irish border and, 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 and the EU negotiation would be different. So yes, it's a, it's a clear element. And then the, the last thing I want to say about that, that was maybe the discussion about ideology, that of course, um, we would say there's so much benefit of the single market, but if you would go and talk to uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, he would give you a very different idea about what the single market has done. The single market has put pressure on social welfare states. I'm not, my, my alternative to him is, for this type of rhetoric is, what would have been the alternative? You would have been a rule taker of the United States, right? I mean, in the EU, you at least had some buffer, but that's not the way they see it, right? They see that the EU has actually infringed on the ability of national, members, of national member state countries to do X, Y, and Z. I don't, see it, I don't say, I, I th as I just said, that, that, that they would have been more sovereign outside, but that is the kind of analysis that you find on the left about the single market. So the single market is also controversial on the left especially. I think less on the right, but on, 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 the, on, on the left. Then with, with the role of European institutions, that's a good one. So, so I have one chapter which is on, on reform. So I give uh, people a possibility, so I give them this way of different EUs that they can, that they can uh, 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 choose from, hypothetical changes. So what you want is, of course, they want an EU that's cheaper. Everyone wants an EU that's cheaper, right? I mean, that's, of course, you probably will get that. They want an EU that focuses on the single market, so that's really important to them, and on peace and security. So I think these kind of pushes of actually von der Leyen to, to create that security in a, in a very dangerous geopolitical world are probably supported by the majority of, of, of the population. And then what they, uh, what they want in the South, so you see some differences, but in the South is much more redistribution in some social security, so Italy, Portugal, Spain, that they want a fair, quote unquote fairer union, right? The, the, the flip side of that in the north is that they, they want less flexibility on the, on the so it's these kind of con conundrums. But what is really interesting when you think about uh, European institutions, so the commission is the least popular. No one likes the commission. So if you ask which decisions, who should make the decisions, the ultimate decisions, not the commission. It's effectively not the way the EU works, but that's not what they want. The council is especially popular by your skeptics. So because probably what, they, what a lot of the exit skeptics want is renationalization, so they want more power to go to the council. And then actually the European Parliament is also not viewed as that bad vis-a-vis -vis the commission, right? So they prefer the parliament over, over the, the commission. But the most popular way of making decisions in the EU right now, you're a skeptic or not, is to rule by referenda. Right? That that's what, what the majority of people want. Do I think that's a good idea? Probably not. But, but it's, it is, it's, it's probably what people want, and, and it's also been really the push. So I think one of the really interesting elements, it's not what I, what, I, what I focus on myself, but you saw it very much in the Brexit debate, right? So what the populists on the left and the right are, are proposing is more plebiscite type government. That's both Podemos, that's also on the right, you see that of, uh, of the Five Star Movement in Italy, what they want is more citizens influence next to elections. And they have been extremely successful in mainstreaming this idea. Mm -hmm. That, that, that elite, that the trustee model of a Burkean, right? Mm -hmm. So that you, you, every five years or every four years elect a politician, that that's enough. No, you, there needs to be more control. And I think that that's something that will be very interesting to, t to see how that develops. So the Netherlands, of course, has reacted to Brexit by making referenda illegal, right? So they've, they've taken them out because of, uh, that's, and that has, of course, been a real big um, uh, issue of the, of the Eurosceptics, but that is a very interesting element of European institutions in the sense that, that, that so people want reform. If they want reform, it's, it's towards the Council, which effectively the Eurozone crisis has done, right? I mean, it's made the Council more important, and they actually want more referenda than anything else, which is maybe we should not always listen to the people in this because it's, it creates all these problems, right? But, th but that's, that is the most popular EU, a EU that's cheaper, that focuses on peace and security and the single market, but it does so by referendums. So it's Swiss type of, you know, like kind of model. Yeah. Okay. Well, last one, or the last one, uh, uh, if you want to share. Do I have a microphone? I don't know. 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 I don't know
Uh, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. I am a second year student in anthropology, so obviously my question will be around identity. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as you were talking about European institutions, uh, the way they work and what, what people want, how they want them to work, uh, but what about what, what, uh, what, what kind of vision are they uh, creating? What kind of Europe are they trying to put in practice? Uh, because when you see countries like Sweden that have high credit to other countries in, no, in uh, Southern Europe, uh, uh, and they get uh, mad because we, Southern Europe does not spend money the way they think they uh, should. Uh, well, does that not tell you much more about Sweden than about North, uh, Southern Europe? It, it, should we not look at Sweden and countries that think like this and think why does this happen? And also, would it be realistic for you, in your opinion, to propose a vision of a diverse Europe, not a unified Europe, because a unified Europe is a neoliberal Europe, is a northern Europe, I guess. I think that's what has been tried a bit, because countries which have more money end up having more power. Uh, this is very simplistic in very simplistic terms, but a diverse Europe that includes uh, all countries and their countries' identities and does not judge the way countries, sp of course you have to monitor the way countries spend money, of course, but uh, sorry. So uh, I would like you to comment on this if possible. Thank you. This, this was inspired by the, by the, by the discussion, actually. I, I'm Simone Tolmello, sorry, I didn't present myself first. I'm a researcher here. Uh, uh, so the question will be, is it more epistemological, you know, like because we start uh, putting more stuff into the discussion, you know, like geography, inequality, economics, you could add the racism, like north and versus south racism, et cetera, et cetera. So you defend yourself greatly. I mean, I really appreciate that. But then the question will be, do we really need a general theory of Brexit, of, uh, of Brexit, of euroscepticism, or for that matter, any social phenomena, or like excellent theories like yours are useful through, as lenses through which look at certain dimensions, but social complex is always more complex. And so the point is, you know, the <laughs> in different places, context matter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's quick. It, it's actually related to what Katrina just asked, just reinforcing that. Uh, my name is Clara, and I'm Clara Sarav, and I'm also a social and cultural anthropologist. And my question actually has to do, I know you're a social politician, and, and so some of the things you handle and you deal with in your book have nothing or, or do not directly have to do with what we anthropologists do. But I'm reinforcing this question on identity, because you mentioned in your talk uh, that you know things like war are like in the back of some people's head, people who uh, are belong to a certain generation. But the fact is that we've seen since World War II things that are directly related to identity, also from an anthropological and heritage point of view, that people did not think about before World War II. And nowadays they are present in people's life every day. And you see that here in Portugal, which is a tiny country where identity connected, for instance, with heritage is so important. So I was wondering, of course, it's very, I understand, very complicated to relate all this and put it together in a bin, but, but I think that, you know, this side of a very day-to-day, uh, -day regional, local identity is also very important when you think of people being aeroseptic or not. And I was wondering if you, as a social, uh, politi you know, in your field, if you ever think about this very specific and kind of tiny topic. Yeah. Thank you. So, so maybe all of these questions have in kind of the same direction. So 
uh, Kate McNamara, who is, a, who is also an EU specialist, who is a constructivist, a social constructivist, who I work with a lot, and I probably go into the more rational category. I'm a political economist, economist and political science by training. But I really believe that a lot of this is, the, a lot of the third on the alternative state, which is very clear, is constructed. Right? I mean, I'm not saying that these are, that it's really the objective viability of the state. It's what people perceive to be the viability of the, uh, of, of, of the state. So I, I, I very much agree with that. So then also the degree to which, what does it mean to be a European might be constructed, which, uh, why do I mention Kate? Because she's worked on the symbol of the Euro. And we pay with the Euro every, every day, and that is, of course has brought Europe much closer to home than, than before when we had all different currencies, right? So definitely, those things are matter and those things are, are important. However, if you then talk a bit more of a, as a, as a, within the Eurozone at least, as a kind of experimentalist, everyone is being treated, right? So everyone gets this Euro in their lives. Why, and then the question becomes, why does it have certain effects in certain contexts? And, I, and that's what I'm interested in, and try to see how that context matters and how that, how that, uh, how that works. So do we need a grand theory or general theory? It depends. I, th I think that we're at different levels of aggregation, right? So some people, it depends on what you're trying to study. So, so I can give you a very, so let me, let me, let me give you a, a Spanish example that I know better. Zapatero, when it, when was the Eurozone it, and, 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 you know, uh, going, being fully included in Europe, it was Spain was in the Champions League of Europe. That's what he said. Right? It was the return of Spain into Europe after years and years of isolation on the Franco probably it's, has been similarly under the dictatorship in Portugal. Right? So it, in that way, there is a particular aspect of countries that have been. But in Poland, the discussion about that has been concept considerably different. Right? About how, and I, I do have to, that the way that I see that is because Poland has done extremely well economically under that period. So it's like, whoa, the EU is kind of enslaving us. It's kind of doing, what, what, what we're coming back to Europe, you need us, right? So it's still this more transactional about what, what is the alternative state. So that's definitely the case, that those, that those things might be really crucial. But I, can, I still think I can explain another pattern where sometimes some cases don't fit that so much. And I am more interested <laughs> in that than I'm interested in the specific Spanish narrative about, and I think that's crucially important, and Juan Diaz Medrano has done beautiful work as a sociologist on that. But, and I read it and I find, but I'm more interested in trying to explain these differences, these puzzles across countries, across time, and how do you see that? But of course, as I also say, there are many, many different other aspects that are gonna be important. But I think that the way I, the, the easy cop out of being, you know, uh, colonial about my theory, if you will, would be to say that, well, there is, can be a lot that can be constructed into the alternative state. Empire was an important narrative in Britain about the alternative state, by, by, by definitely, right? Whereas in the Netherlands, it's like, well, yeah, we used to, be, my husband always says we're Spanish, you never were an empire because you didn't have any land. And I'm like, yeah, we were made smarter, we only had ports, right? So, so it's this idea that, 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 that what it means to be an empire, Dutch people will never say we, we, we have all this, you know, we're a small country that used to be something and we were rich, but now we're not and we, we have to deal with Germany, you know, that, that kind of thing, right? So, so the, the, the narratives are gonna be different based on, on the context. No, I, I no doubtly think that that's important. But I also think that those narratives are, there, are often there constructed by politicians for certain reasons, right? And then the interesting thing is how they're constructed and why do some people go along with those narratives and other people do not, even though they're all in the same situation, right? And, and, and then we, s we find people who are of different classes who we think should be diametrically opposite doing the same thing. And that's what I'm sometimes kind of interested in. But I would totally adhere to that. I think that, that you know, some people have suggested that I come from a rational, more political economist to a Bulgarian, that everything. Yes, things are very much constructed. I, I, am, I am not going to be a person, but what I'm interested in is why do certain people go along with it and others don't? And, and, and that's what I find very interesting in my own work. Then with regards to the kind of identity and what you guys were, were talking about, actually, in the end of the book, the, one of the reviewers said, chuck this, 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 this chapter out, it's not interesting, because you're giving your opinion, as if, if you, it's really bad to give your opinion, right? So, so what I said is that what should the EU do? So I thought if I write a book, if I go and spend time writing a book, it gives me the liberty that I don't have in an article, which I can, s I can say things, right? And I can make a story, I can show you different steps, and then I can, I, I, I know also more than it's in the book kind of thing, but I, I select it carefully what I put in and what I don't put in. In the end, I actually asked that question. So what is then the future? 
for the EU. And one way is that actually you should take its motto more seriously, which is united in diversity. That's clearly a one size fits all is not going to work, right? Because even if, so Dijsselbloem, probably not su super popular here, not very popular in the Netherlands either, but uh, the, the Eurogroup president, I was at something at the, in Berlin at the Hattie School, and he said the only way in which Europe can go forward is if we have growth, right? So if we have growth. And I said, I just gave you a presentation that growth actually might fuel skepticism, <laughs> right? I mean, you just don't listen at all. And also the fact is that I'm not saying that you should treat member states badly, right? I mean, that's not what I'm saying. But, but the, the element is it's not that easy. And I think that, that, that one important element, which, is, which I've done already a little bit, is to try to tell people that the way that people view the EU is very much through their national vision. It can also be that it's other identities. I, of course, I very much agree with that. I, I've not studied that here, but I, I would have openness to, towards that. But I, I think that, that really the idea when you go to Brussels oftentimes is if we just generate more growth, it's going to be fine. This is a problem of lack of growth in the South, especially. <laughs> Lack of competition, if they would only follow the German rules, we would be X, Y, and Z. And then I'm just saying, well, but, but you cannot, you know, what happened in the Eurozone crisis is that Italy had its democratic government taken out and a technocratic government taken in. And then you later on say, you should, you, do, you, do, you, do you blame Italians for thinking this is a very technocratic union that doesn't care about democracy in Italy or about the Greeks? Or, there's a real legacy of the Eurozone crisis and how different member states were treated by the core. And that what the book is very much about is how, so what I, what I, find, what I find really difficult is that the EU then thinks, okay, these quote unquote peripheral, I don't mean that peripheral in that they're really peripheral, but the, the peripheral within the EU, right? So countries in the East and the, and the, and the South are not, are not growing as much as, as, as the core. Then they say, well, the, the, we, we don't really have to deliver anything because they're going to be pro-EU anyway, right? So, and, th and therefore, you know, we can, what we need to focus on is to restrict labor migration within the EU to make sure that, this, that the Dutch and the Swedes and the Finns are not going to be more Eurosceptic. And I have a fundamental problem with that. Like the way you need to make sure is that the EU works for every member state. It cannot work more for one member state than the other. And in some focus groups that I have done, for example, that's what you hear. The, the, the primarily irritation is if you ask for people, it's the idea that they are treated as a second class member state. <laughs> and, and that is of course, and that gives you a sense of that, that's what I say, that, 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 that it is about, that if, if we get it, so this is my worry about a two-speed Europe. If we, if we, either you give full flexibility to member states and you allow them sometimes to go ahead and sometimes not, and you allow to, to people kind of to borrow from each other politically, how you organize that politically, I don't know, right? But allow for more flexibility. If you do it in two speeds, you're gonna, who's gonna belong to, the t to this first speed, <laughs> right? Is Italy going to go in the first speed? So, exactly, so, so, and then at a certain point you get a discussion where you actually water down the status quo for member states that are still supportive of the EU, and then you even get a bigger problem in the end, right? So I, I think that the sense is at how far do you go? But then the other, if I would, would argue against myself, it's a big discussion about also what, what then the EU is, right? So one push of Timmermans, who was the Dutch commissioner, has been to start the Article 7 procedure, right? So if you, if you ha I have a breach of rule of law in the EU, the EU has this, what, what is called a nuclear option, that it can start a procedure against you and take away your voting rights. This was against Poland, right? And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the justice uh, 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 reform. It would never get into fruition because Hungary would probably block it in the council. It needs unanimity, but nonetheless, it was a symbol to put it, to put it forward. So how far do you then go in that, uh, in that flexibility? Mm -hmm. Do you say that it's fine that you know, ex, you know, minorities are treated a certain way or, or women are discriminated against in, 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 in the Supreme Court uh, reform in, in, in Poland, right? Because what it was is that women had to retire earlier than men, right? <laughs> that was one part of the issue, except for many other parts of that reform. So it's difficult because then you get into, the, are you infringing on national sovereignty? Are you acting emperor as, as a core that is, that is pushing your values on the, on the periphery, right? So it's, it's also a very difficult discussion, but one of the elements that I'd say that, that we need to think about more differentiation, but probably not differentiation in the sense that we have some core group and some peripheral group because that creates probably even a watering down of the status quo for from, uh, some of these members. So hopefully I've dealt with, with the question somewhat.
Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Boa tarde a todos. Um, muito obrigada por uh, terem estado aqui connosco esta tarde. Queria agradecer uh, a vossa presença. Uh, ver a sala cheia neste dia é sempre uma alegria para todos. Um, queria agradecer a presença do Sr. Vice-Reitor, João Barreiros, que tem, vem de uma área e de uma casa diferente e que nos veio visitar e que esteve aqui tão interessado a assistir a este nosso debate. Espero que venha mais vezes e que tenha oportunidade, tempo e disponibilidade para conhecer melhor aquilo que uh, fazemos. Sei que já conhece, mas uh, vir ao terreno dá sempre uma, uma, uma realidade diferente. Portanto, muito obrigada por estar aqui. Agradeço que transmita os nossos cumprimentos ao Sr. Reitor. E, uh, portanto, obrigado aos nossos colegas. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your presentation. It was so clear, so assertive, so organized, and so inspiring. It's really five stars, five stars. Thank you so much for being here and to participate in this, uh, in this uh, uh, academic year. Um, how do you say? Start, starting. Opening, yes, opening, yes, because it, it has already started. Uh, mas as minhas palavras vão, evidentemente, sobretudo para os estudantes que escolheram o ICS para vir fazer o seu doutoramento nas nossas várias áreas, nos nossos uh, vários programas. Uh, para nós, os estudantes de doutoramento são sempre os investigadores mais jovens, são eles que estão a fazer a investigação de ponta, e por isso os acolhemos da melhor maneira que sabemos e gostava de talvez reforçar uma ideia que foi dita tanto pela nossa diretora Karen Wall como pelo João Vasconcelos, uh, da Comissão de Estudos, presidente da Comissão de Estudos Pós-Graduados e do Conselho Pedagógico. O trabalho da tese é realmente um trabalho muito solitário e a solo, não pode deixar de ser. Nós confrontamos e competimos com connosco próprios. Mas... Uh, Apesar disso, apesar de terem que trabalhar na construção desse projeto de tese original e fantástico, não deixem de participar ativamente na vida científica do ICS e na nossa vida social. Uh, repararão que o ICS procura ter um ambiente colaborativo, solidário e, portanto, nunca se esqueçam que têm este ambiente seguro, inspirador, é exigente, é verdade, mas é um ambiente muito aberto e muito próximo. E como disse o Gustavo, enjoy your time at ICS. E muito obrigada. Senhora Diretora, Karin, caros colegas, thank you, uh, Catherine, for your very sharp and clear presentation. It was a pleasure and it was very inspiring for me. I will switch to Portuguese now because, okay. E a razão porque é inspiradora a comunicação da, da doutora uh, Catherine de Vries é que eu estava a pensar ali sossegadinho com os meus botões que a Universidade de Lisboa é um pouco como a União Europeia nesta matéria. Nós temos países grandes e países pequenos, temos países com 500 estudantes temos países com 180 estudantes, 200 estudantes. Temos países com 10 mil estudantes. Temos países com orçamentos de poucos milhões, mesmo poucos, e países com orçamentos acima dos 100 milhões. Uh, portanto, temos uma variedade enorme. Temos uma história diferente. Formámos blocos diferentes no passado e dentro de cada um dos blocos formámos parcerias diferentes e preferenciais. Com isso, ganhámos uma cultura, uma história, uma tradição. 
e isso uh, cria o mesmo problema de identidades que aqui foi levantado pelas, pelas, pelos colegas da área de, das antropologias, ou da antropologia, uh, cria problemas de uh, autoperceção, quem somos, uh, e como devemos ser vistos pelos outros, que é outro problema muito complicado, nós temos, achamos que os outros nos devem ver de determinada maneira, e portanto, de certa maneira, a Universidade de Lisboa é um pouco como a, a União Europeia, com por enquanto não, problemas de Brexit, uh, espero que não venha a tê-los, e se os tiver, que os tenha bem geridos, sem situações ou soluções muito conflituosas, mas isso seria pura especulação falar de uma coisa dessas nesta altura. Uh, aproveitar para, para apresentar os, os nossos estudantes novos, os outros que já cá estão têm alguma obrigação de, de conhecer um pouco a Universidade de Lisboa. A Universidade de Lisboa, na forma nova, começou há seis anos e meio. Na verdade, começou um pouco antes, porque o trabalho preparatório da fusão envolveu muita gente, de todas as escolas, dos dois lados, durante muito tempo. Mas os resultados, os resultados, enfim, começam a partir de 2013, e uh, eu dividiria agora esta intervenção, que quero que seja curta, em duas partes. O que é que foram estes seis anos e meio? O que é que nós somos hoje? O que é que conseguimos definir do que somos hoje? E aquilo que está em cima da mesa. Eu chamaria um, um passado recente e um futuro próximo. No passado recente, a história é interessante. Nós tivemos que normalizar, regulamentar com algumas bases comuns, criar o fundamento jurídico da universidade, que é transversal em muitas coisas, mas que não é transversal noutras, como a União Europeia. Temos estatutos próprios das escolas que nos permitem diferenciação e queremos que se mantenha essa diferenciação, essa distinção. Por outro lado, queremos que haja um mínimo de entendimento comum. E isso também, como na União Europeia, manifesta-se em vários momentos críticos. Na política de defesa, sendo que a defesa para nós é uma outra coisa, os nossos eh, opositores, eu não usaria a palavra inimigos, são os nossos competidores, digamos assim, e, eh, os nosso, e no orçamento, como é óbvio, como tal qual a União Europeia. E, portanto, temos os problemas da União Europeia aqui eh, colocados dentro. É uma universidade com 50 mil estudantes, aproximadamente, é uma universidade em que o staff tem, portanto, entre professores, investigadores e, e, e pessoal técnico e administrativo, são cerca de 7 mil pessoas. É uma, é uma pequena cidade. Uhum. Uh, se estendermos, uh, enquanto conceito de estudante, ao, 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 aos cursos de pós-graduação, uh, de pessoas que nos frequentam e que não são nossos alunos em cursos conferentes de grau, de primeiro, segundo ou terceiro ciclo, a comunidade uh, andará aí para os 54 mil, 55 mil uh, estudantes, digamos assim o que é muita gente. Uh, temos um, um, um passado recente que teve que mostrar a afirmação externa da nova universidade e o principal instrumento para o fazer foi uh, a participação e a nossa um, in inclusão em rankings. Uh, antes de 2013, a nossa percepção dos outros em relação a nós era uma percepção muitíssimo distorcida, porque as duas universidades de tamanho médio não conseguiriam ter expressão a nível mundial. Hoje estamos no lugar 182 do ranking de Xangai, eu refiro de Xangai porque é provavelmente o melhor ranking do mundo e aquele que mais seriamente avalia as, a competência de, e, e o valor comparativo das universidades. E somos das 75 melhores universidades da Europa, estamos, estamos nessa posição. Alguns dos nossos cursos são, podem ser incluídos nos 10 melhores do mundo, o que é uma coisa interessante. Por exemplo, detecção remota, Portugal é abaixo da posição 10 no mundo. Temos cerca de... Sim, é muito curioso a posição dos nossos cursos nas, nas, nos, nos rankings. Uh, temos muitos cursos colocados na, na, até à, à posição 25 e temos muitíssimos colocados até à posição 75. Portanto, temos aqui focos de excelência, não todos, nem tudo o que fazemos é muito bom, mas temos algumas coisas em que fazemos trabalho muito bem feito. Uh, a nossa universidade gera, faz mover qualquer coisa como 500 milhões de euros, dá-vos uma ideia, é um número muito redondo, mas é muito aproximadamente o que nós fazemos todos os anos, dos quais apenas 200 milhões vêm do Estado, diretamente o que é um, uma parte do problema. Aliás, para se perceber melhor aquilo que é um dos assuntos no, no futuro próximo, que é o financiamento, nós recebemos do Estado cerca de 200 milhões, muito próximo de 200 milhões, e a nossa massa salarial, ou seja, 
os salários dos nossos professores e dos nossos funcionários uh, técnicos e administrativos são 260 milhões. Portanto, o Estado uh, é deficitário na nossa, no nosso financiamento nesta dimensão, o que é um número muito uh, expressivo. Uh, é uma comunidade que tem 18 escolas. Uh, a escola mais pequena é, de facto, o ICS, se olharmos para o número de alunos, mas não é a mais pequena se olharmos, por exemplo, para a publicação ou atividade científica. Uh, e, portanto, as escolas, medidas por critérios diferentes ou olhadas por perspectivas diferentes, são coisas diferentes. Uh, é também pequena pelo número de, de, de investigadores, uh, uh, mas já não é pequena, por exemplo, pelo efeito social percebido que tem. Portanto, há aqui muitas maneiras de olharmos para isto e todas as escolas da universidade têm, muitas têm orgulho muito forte, Algumas gostariam de viver sozinhas, tal como na União Europeia. Já fomos império, porque é que não somos aqui? outra vez? Não vou dizer qual é a escola que tem esse pensamento de forma muito predominante, mas há outras que têm. Há outras que têm. Uh, e, portanto, vocês, os que escolheram esta, esta escola para fazer o seu, o seu aperfeiçoamento académico e o seu estudo e investigação, acho que fizeram uma boa escolha. A escola é muito boa, mas uh, faz parte de uma universidade que tem vindo a tentar aumentar a coesão, tal como a União. Temos estado tentado aumentar a coesão. Só que a coesão é muito difícil de, de, de conseguir. Conseguimos alguns traços importantes de coesão. Por exemplo, temos muito mais cursos em que partilhamos recursos de diferentes escolas. Isso é muito bom. Temos mais capacidade de fazer a discussão de aspectos de correntes, como o fecho de contas, orçamentos, etc., o que é também muito bom. Temos capacidade de apoiar outras escolas, até financeiramente, quando é necessário, ou de outras formas em recursos diferentes, nomeadamente humanos. E, portanto, conseguimos fazer algum pequeno caminho no, 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 na, na coesão. Mas conseguimos, sobretudo, melhorar muito a atividade científica. A Universidade de Lisboa hoje define-se, se quiséssemos encontrar todas as componentes do ranking de Xangai, aquela que melhor, mais nos favorece é a atividade científica. Nós não temos... Nós não, investigação. E, portanto, vocês contribuirão para isso. Contribuirão para isso, não só fazendo bons livros, que espero que os façam, mas também fazendo, durante o tempo em que são estudantes, publicação científica em revistas devidamente uh, referenciáveis e, e, e dignas de crédito. É isso que é importante. Uh, já agora, não se esqueçam de, quando assinam, assinarem Universidade de Lisboa, porque senão não conta para o ranking. É, exatamente. Isto é o que, o que nós fomos fazendo. Algumas coisas que fizemos também são muito dignas de nota e passam despercebidas. Eu vou referir uma só, porque estive muito ligada a ela e porque percebi a intensidade do que foi feito. Tem a ver com o património. Há três anos atrás fez o primeiro levantamento do património conjunto das duas universidades, não existia. Uh, hoje existe, está devidamente tratado até do ponto de vista, de, vamos chamar, uh, informático. Uh, e depois disso, uh, com a integração do Instituto de Investigação Científica e Tropical e mais uns, uns acontecimentos de percurso, acabamos por, por aumentar muitíssimo o nosso património. Por exemplo, estamos a acabar a obra de requalificação do Jardim Botânico Tropical, que todos conhecem, por cima de, dos pastéis de Belém. Eu espero que a professora, a doutora Catarina, lá tenha a oportunidade de comer um pastel de Belém. O jardim por trás, que está fechado, agora é nosso. E está fechado porque está em reabilitação profunda, com um valor muito significativo. Uh, estava num estado absolutamente inaceitável. Uh, fizemos a recuperação com a ajuda da Câmara de Lisboa, mas com uma participação que é maior que da Câmara de Lisboa, na reabilitação do Jardim Botânico do Príncipe Real. Temos os três Jardins Botânicos de Lisboa. O museu tem vindo a fazer um trabalho muito, muito importante na, na requalificação, não só das instalações, na política de exposições, mas também, sobretudo, na gestão das coleções. O museu é muito valioso pelas coleções. Ninguém conhece o museu. Ou poucas pessoas conhecem o museu e, quando o conhecem, conhecem por algumas razões. O, as coleções do museu são absolutamente fantásticas. Vamos começar a obra do Pavilhão de Portugal, se não houver contestação jurídica do empreiteiro, esse classificado em segundo lugar, ainda este ano, o que nos permitirá dispor de, uma, de, um, de um complexo para, pós, para uh, formação uh, avançada, mas também para conferências e, e outras iniciativas da área da ciência e da cultura que, que, de que a Universidade carece. Distribuímos pela cidade de Lisboa com muitos polos, uh, alguns não sabem, mas tivemos até há muito poucos dias atrás um reator nuclear em Sacavém, no Instituto de Tecnologia Nuclear, o ITN. Temos o nosso polo mais afastado, é no Conselho de Oeiras, é o Tagos Parque, onde estão instaladas empresas e algumas áreas de, de formação 
do Instituto Superior Técnico, temos um polo no Jamor, no meio do estádio, no estádio Nacional, que faz da melhor investigação que se consegue fazer em Portugal sobre atividade e desporto, e eu tenho que puxar a brasa à minha sardinha, e que promove uh, licenciados e, e mestres e doutores que têm rendimentos muito elevados, uh, rendimentos pessoais, digo eu. E, portanto, sempre esperámos que houvesse uma distribuição de orçamentos pelas escolas a partir do rendimento dos licenciados, mestres e doutores das escolas. Mas isso nunca aconteceu. Passando agora para aquilo que é o futuro, o futuro próximo. O futuro próximo tem um conjunto de desafios grandes. Vou pôr o primeiro desafio de todos, que é um desafio que passa um bocadinho ao lado do ICS. E eu sei que alguns estudantes, sobretudo os que não são nacionais, sentirão isto melhor. É o facto de, eu vou chamar a isto, o efeito do preço das casas. Uh, os últimos anos têm vindo, por via do desenvolvimento turístico, da procura de Lisboa, a fazer um aumento muito grande do, do preço das, dos quartos. Desde o 25 de abril não houve em Lisboa política, à exceção de um caso, política de desenvolvimento de novas residências. Não houve. Ora, isso faz quase 50 anos, à volta de 50 anos de não investimento. Mas antes também não havia. E, portanto, a situação já não é nova. É uma situação que não tem um século, mas para lá se aproxima. As residências que utilizámos, que, que tínhamos até, até ao aumento da fusão, seis anos atrás, eram residências que eram o aluguer de casas de habitação no meio da cidade. Todos sabemos que as residências não podem ser isso. E à medida que a lei das rendas foi aplicando, fomos perdendo essa possibilidade. E, portanto, ficámos com menos quartos e com uma necessidade absoluta de residências. É por isso que transformámos isto num, num, num fator de luta principal para aquilo que nos resta de mandato e, e pensamos que vai ser continuado no futuro. Porquê? Porque uma parte muito significativa dos estudantes que conseguem lugar nas escolas da Universidade de Lisboa não se inscrevem porque não conseguem fazer face ao preço dos quartos. O preço dos quartos, para a vossa informação, penso que alguns saberão isto melhor que outros e alguns sentirão na pele, anda acima dos 500 euros, valor médio em zonas centrais ou mais centrais de Lisboa. Isto é inaceitável. É um custo que, eh, em dois meses, representa mais que o valor atual da propina. E, portanto, temos aqui uma distorção que é preciso corrigir. Como o mercado eh, eh, se abriu para a iniciativa de privados que criaram residências, mas cujos preços começam acima desse valor e que vão até aos 1.200, 1.300 euros, então a Universidade obrigou-se a lançar um, massivamente quartos no mercado para fazer baixar um bocadinho esta, esta, esta pressão. É uma pressão decisiva, afasta alguns dos nossos melhores alunos para terem uma ideia quantitativa no último, no último acesso uh, ao ensino superior. Mil estudantes da Uni colocados na Universidade de Lisboa não se inscreveram e uh, a percentagem de estudantes fora de Lisboa é superior a 80% e desses, não inquiridos, claro, porque não tivemos forma de o fazer, isto passou-se há um mês atrás, são estudantes que não tiveram maneira de fazer face ao custo da habitação. Portanto, elegemos as residências. E o que é que já se fez sobre as residências? Ainda pouco, porque construir em Portugal é muito difícil. Não é pela, porque o cimento aqui custa mais a secar, é porque o processo administrativo e os licenciamentos são inaceitáveis. Construímos e terminámos antes do verão a primeira fase de uma residência na ajuda. A ajuda escapa-nos, mas a ajuda tem quase 12 mil estudantes da Universidade de Lisboa e não, não tem residências próximas, nem tem habitação próxima. E, portanto, fizemos uma primeira residência. Estamos a, quando falamos de uma residência, são entre 200 e 300 quartos. Temos o programa e o projeto aprovado. Falta um licenciamento pequenino de demolição para a antiga Cantina 2, aqui na, na, na Avenida das Forças Armadas, que vai permitir fazer mais 300 quartos. E temos aqui muito próximo, mesmo em frente ao ICS, vai fazer sombra para cá, quando tiverem construídos o projeto de três blocos, já temos financiamento para isso. Temos arquiteto selecionado, projeto quase concluído e, portanto, haverá novas residências aqui capazes de acolher 900 estudantes, porque este é o campus central e, de facto, tem muitos dos estudantes da Universidade de Lisboa. Portanto, residências. O segundo fator que está em cima da mesa e que vai merecer muita atenção chama-se uh, uh, obsolescência. Nós estamos a, a envelhecer, em regra, todos nós, humanos e os animais também, e as plantas também, envelhecem um ano por ano. O que acontece é que, isto é uma fatalidade, envelhecemos um ano por ano, o que acontece é que não estamos a substituir os mais velhos por mais novos. Estamos a substituí-los devagar. Em 2016 foram abertos 160, entraram 160 professores, investigadores, maioritariamente professores, 
e uh, no ano seguinte a mesma coisa e este ano um bocadinho menos. Uh, isto quer dizer que conseguimos alguma renovação. Nos anos anteriores isto não existia. Aliás, eram muito residuais os concursos abertos. E isso é que produziu o envelhecimento médio. Para aqueles que não, não têm ideia destes números, a, a idade média da Universidade de Lisboa é 51,6 anos. O que é um número muito uh, respeitoso, porque são pessoas com muita experiência, mas também muito criminoso, porque deixa antecipar que a muito curto prazo teremos um problema de rejuvenescimento de gerações que afetará áreas inteiras. Este problema é um problema complicado e as soluções para ele não são, nem podem ser, a abertura de concursos, os processos simples de regularização de precários como aconteceram. Porquê? Porque o problema essencial disto são duas coisas. Ter dinheiro para suportar e sustentar. Não há maneira de sustentar se não houver dinheiro, digo eu. Ou e ter as ferramentas jurídicas para tal. E aqui entra um outro aspecto que também faz parte do futuro próximo. Este ano vivemos com uma regra em, do Orçamento de Estado em que estávamos limitados ao crescimento de despesas com solo em 3%. Felizmente é 3% não considerando os precários, os empregos científicos, os pref-papes, que são os precários, o emprego científico e mais umas coisinhas pequeninas. Porque se fosse, o crescimento da universidade tinha sido muito superior a, a 3%. Para se manter em 3%, há uma imensa uh, obra de contenção e de gestão dos processos concursais para a seleção de novos professores ou de novos investigadores. Se tudo continuar no ano que vem, a Universidade de Lisboa, porque este ano contratou pessoas ao longo de todo o ano, ou seja, pagou a alguns 12 meses ou 14 meses, mas a outros pagou 3 meses ou 2 meses ou vai pagar um mês. Mas no ano que vem vai pagar 14 meses. E isso atira-nos automaticamente para além do limite dos 3%. Obriga Obrigando-nos a parar as, as contratações. Se isso acontecer, ninguém contrata na universidade. Como não temos lei de orçamento, a angústia está prolongada até termos lei de orçamento. Se não sair até 31 de dezembro ou 30 de dezembro, como costuma, viveremos a angústia por janeiro e fevereiro. Portanto, temos aqui um problema. Podemos até ter dinheiro, algumas escolas têm dinheiro e têm necessidade, mas têm um constrangimento desta natureza. Este, este obstáculo limita o futuro da universidade e é uma pedra na sustentabilidade. Obsolescência. Acabamos por ter professores velhos demais, quando precisávamos de os ter mais novos. É claro, nem vou falar nas condições da atratividade da função docente e da função de investigador com os salários que são praticados em Portugal. Obviamente os melhores não ficam cá. Se encontrarem desafios de carreira competitivos e, e salários ou condições de trabalho ou remuneração mais adequadas, migrarão. Este processo tem vindo a produzir sangria entre os melhores. Há sangria nos estudantes, os nossos melhores estudantes, este ano, o, o, o curso com nota mais elevada foi o curso de, aeronáutica, de engenharia aeroespacial. Como disse alguém na SIC, afroespacial, enganando-se a ler. Uh, mas pronto, foi uma coincidência. Uh, afroespacial. Mas o curso de afroespacial teve um estudante com 19,2, ou coisa que o valha, que não se inscreveu. E a pergunta é, como é que um maluco que tem 19,2 e entra no curso mais exigente de Portugal, não, não se inscreve? É natural, está, está nos Estados Unidos. E isto acontece em vários sítios. Nós não temos política de bolsas, captação de, dos melhores estudantes, não temos maneira de incentivar o mérito dos bons estudantes, isso não existe. Temos maneira de incentivar uma combinação de algum mérito escolar com umas, uh, os critérios económicos das, uh, que, que, que definem a possibilidade económica da família para as bolsas e pouco mais. Este desafio que se manifesta nos estudantes também se manifesta nos... nos temos outro desafio muito importante, que é o desafio da internacionalização. Mas cuidado, a internacionalização está a ser vista de forma traiçoeira. Porque como o dinheiro falta, vamos buscar estudantes, no matter where, vamos a qualquer lado buscar estudantes. E isso está a introduzir uma degradação da qualidade dos estudantes. Portanto, é preciso ir buscar estudantes, mas é preciso encontrar critérios mínimos de seleção de estudantes. As regras atuais permitem que qualquer escola dentro das suas regras internas, consiga fazer essas seleções, nomeadamente para os cursos de licença de mestrado e de, e, de, e de doutoramento, onde a degradação é ainda mais notória e onde as faltas de bases de algumas de estudantes originários de, enfim, de muitos países, não, não digo nenhum para não criar nenhum conflito, 
não têm nem base matemática, nem nas ciências, quando vão para, não têm base biológica, nem de química, e quando vão para cursos de artes e humanidades ou de ciências sociais, não sabem ler e escrever e dificilmente falam segunda língua. Esta situação, eu hoje de manhã tive que, numa, numa instituição paralela, o Instituto Superior de Ciências Sociais e Políticas da, da Universidade de Lisboa, tivemos uma avaliação externa e, e este fator foi completamente realçado. Portanto, temos aqui um problema e um desafio de qualidade na seleção de nossos estudantes, nomeadamente naqueles ciclos de estudo onde, onde as universidades e as escolas têm maior liberdade de seleção. E a seleção, esta liberdade, deveria se orientar-nos para critérios de elevação da qualidade e não o contrário. Mas como o que precisamos é dinheiro para poder financiar o resto, então temos que se calhar abrir um pouco e isto está a gerar uma situação de perda de qualidade e a longo prazo, de, de mérito, de percepção da qualidade dos nossos licenciados, mestres e doutores no mundo inteiro. Portanto, este desafio vai estar em cima da mesa. Mas o mais importante dos desafios vai ser o financiamento das instituições de ensino superior. Uh, há vários, o último, a última legislatura teve um acordo de regime, digamos assim, um contrato de programa assinado entre o, o Governo e uh, o CRUP, e, uh, e, portanto, o Conselho de Reitores das Universidades Portuguesas, que permitiu alguma estabilidade. No essencial foi respeitado, no essencial. Mas temos um novo governo pela frente e temos um novo quadro de quatro anos para decidir. E o que se passar daqui até janeiro, para todos os que têm que gerir financeiramente, eu faço isso na, na universidade, faço a gestão, o planeamento e a gestão financeira. É, é, é o meu trabalho. E, e isso é muito, vai ser muito difícil se não houver um incremento, um impulso adicional, inicial, no financiamento das universidades. Qualquer, eu vou dizer isto de outra maneira, qualquer coisa que se veja, porque a conservação dos valores anteriores não chega, com o aumento, com a libertação das progressões remuneratórias, em virtude de concursos ou de, de classificações eh, internas, de avaliações internas feitas nas escolas, os, os encargos subiram, mas o Orçamento de Estado não os compensa. E, portanto, a, a taxa de cobertura das despesas com pessoal pela dotação do Orçamento de Estado é cada vez menor. Isto não é aceitável mais. A Universidade faz o que pode. Uh, cerca de 80 milhões destes 500 milhões de que vos falei são gerados por participadas da Universidade e não diretamente por escolas. Mas 80 milhões não é suficiente para conseguir resolver isto tudo. As nossas propinas valem, grosso modo, 60, 65 milhões. Todas as propinas somadas, de todos os ciclos de estudo. E esses 60, 65 milhões são incorporados e adicionados aos 200 milhões de dotação do Orçamento de Estado, para pagar os salários. Mas depois temos a eletricidade, a água, a segurança, a limpeza e tudo o resto que também custa caro. O resultado, o desenvolvimento em termos de eh, investimento, quer o investimento seja infraestrutural, ou seja, um investimento na qualidade do nosso trabalho e na promoção do nosso trabalho, está carente de financiamento. E com carência de financiamento nestes setores, a Universidade não pode manter as posições e o relevo que tem atualmente. Estes são os desafios que estão em cima da mesa, dos, dos, dos mais importantes. Pois, claro, há muitos outros. Uh, conservar bem as nossas coisas, tentar aumentar a nossa relação com o exterior, fazer parcerias, ser capaz de transferir conhecimento para a sociedade, coisa que fazemos com muita dificuldade. Uh, muita dificuldade, à exceção de algumas escolas de tecnologia, o resto não acontece. E, portanto, temos aqui um problema muito sério, porque devíamos estar a ter sucesso pela nossa qualidade e não temos. Temos um problema de registro de patentes e de... Cá está. Em parte devido ao, ao financiamento necessário para, para, para o registro das patentes, que são caríssimas, como sabem. Portanto, temos aqui um, um déficit de financiamento que nos está a... Não sei, deve haver palavras populares boas para isso. Mas, pelo menos, limitar. Eu estava a pensar numa palavra de caráter muito mais forte, mas pronto. Uh, desejo a todos os que começam agora que sejam felizes aqui, que passem aqui bom tempo. Uh, há aqueles que estão a sair que tenham... Que estão a sair quanto, enquanto estudantes, claro, a terminar as suas teses, que se sintam gratificados e que, e que tenham ambições grandes, mas não muito grandes, porque a diferença entre o que somos capazes de fazer e a ambição dá-nos infelicidade. Muito obrigado. de Lisboa são desafios, são problemas e o ICS também se sente parte desses desafios e dessas oportunidades e desses problemas e, portanto, tentaremos também contribuir 
para uh, uh, esse, uh, esse projeto que é a Universidade de Lisboa. Obrigada a todos. Thank you, Catherine. E, e convido-vos para tomar um café, um chá ou um, um, um moscatel aqui na, no átrio. Muito obrigada a todos. Obrigada também.